What is the deal with this? We can't. Yo, dude, Will, if you can help us out, we need people to stop walking across the street. Oh, my God. No, it's not. It's not a thing. We can't. It's not going to be an option. Don't worry about it. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah, we can, like, put this and we can put these chairs over there. Put it right here. Yeah, just like this. That'd be good. This is a blockade. Yeah, thank you. All right. Just put it right here. Put it right here. Yeah. We can just put another one on that side. Oh, hey, dude. What's up, man? Let me just walk you off. Yeah, what's up? Where did this come from? Oh, it's yours. I thought it was his. I was like, yeah, that's wow. that thing. Yeah, Jordan, I'm going to move the chair to block it. I'm going to block it. Thank you. Yeah. I also need another favor. Testing. 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 Okay. Boom, we're set. Oh, 
Testing, testing. Testing, testing. Testing, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. No? Is, is, should we go higher? Did you say no? Yeah, he said no. He doesn't know. Hey, hey, Steve. So thanks for coming. Just let me, I'm sitting next to Christian in the front over there. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so you'll be using this mic for the panel, okay. and the rest of the panelists will be mic'd up with a wireless mic. Sounds great. Cool. Sounds awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Go ahead and keep talking. 
Testing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Testing. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Keep going. Hey, testing that this should be coming through in the live stream. All right, then.
Testing. Hey, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. If you could all take a seat. It's happening. Yeah, just keep it on. Thanks. Uh, thanks for coming. If everyone could be seated, please. That'd be great. Maybe uh, can you dim the lights a little bit? All right, well, uh, I remember when this meetup started, it was a couple nerds in an obscure tech incubator, and here we are. So, a little bit of growth. Um, I want to thank you all for coming to see Vitalik Buterin, Joseph Poon, and Jun Hasegawa. Uh, these are three of the leading minds in decentralized technology development, and I think they might be the future emperors of the universe one day. So, yeah, <laughs> you're in the right room. Uh, yeah, so uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to give a couple of shout outs and thanks. First of all, thank, I'd like to thank the organizers of this meetup for helping me with all this, uh, especially Ken Fromm. He has really, sitting right over there, he really went above and beyond helping me secure this venue and plan for everything. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the AV crew uh, Jordan and Zach, uh, they're, they're live streaming it. So, you know, there's 600 people in this room, but there'll probably be thousands watching. So, uh, that's pretty crazy. Uh, and also, I, finally, I'd like to thank Consensus. They are sponsoring this event. Uh, so without them, this would not be possible. So thanks for all that. And, uh, yeah, uh, if Consensus would like to come up, uh, they could give it. They'll tell you a little, about, a little bit about what they're working on. So, here they are. All right. Thank you, Grant, for making this event happen. Uh, Grant really helped kick this off, and if it wasn't for Grant, we wouldn't be able to join forces and make it happen. So, I want to give Grant a big uh, round of applause real quick. He really deserves it. Right on. Yeah, so what's up, blockchain people? This is, uh, it's great to see a big crowd like this. Um, I'll tell you about me real briefly. My name is Ron Patiro, and I am out here to get consensus established in the Bay Area and help build our decentralized future. So my role is basically to help build the presence and attract good people, attract good companies, and get people to apply for some of the 80 jobs we have on our website. You're gonna hear a little bit more about what consensus does. We're broken up in a few different functions to help build the decentralized future. So consensus.net, go check us out, apply for some jobs. I'm gonna pass it off to Sam, who's gonna tell you a bit about our product function. Hello, uh, it is amazing to see so many people on the West Coast here. I spent a lot of time in Brooklyn, so it's awesome to see the energy here. Uh, I'm Chief Strategy Officer of Consensus. We started uh, almost three years ago now uh, in a small room in Brooklyn and trying to gather some of the most intelligent Ethereum-oriented people that we could find to build products. Uh, at that time, I like to say it's a little bit like it was 1991 and we have no idea what a web server looks like. We have no idea what uh, you know, any of the architectures look like that we're, that we're going to be building on. So what we did is we got smart people, we put them together, and we asked them to try to make things that look like the infrastructure of a new internet. Uh, Three years later, we have lots of amazing things, things that are enterprise products, things that are uh, amazing contributions to the open source community, like 
I see some MetaMask people here, for instance. Uh, so we have a, uh, a broad uh, expanse of products that we work on. Uh, if you'd like to talk about those things, uh, please do with me or any of the people in consensus. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, we also have Enterprise as well. <laughs> Hey everyone, my name is Alex Voto. Uh, thank you all so much for coming, and big thank you to the volunteers who helped check in. These guys are not being paid, they're fantastic. <laughs> big shout out to Blockchain at Berkeley, one of our key partners in the area for jumping in to do that on a moment's notice. Um, so one of the important things that Consensus does is actually uh, to make these Ethereum applications practical uh, for organizations uh, who are trying to envision uh, their path from centralized to decentralized worlds. Um, so uh, Consensus does a lot of consultancy uh, with large organizations, which include kind of traditional companies, uh, large governments, nonprofits, any large group that's, that's trying to figure out how to take uh, their old institutional structures and um, convert them toward an Ethereum-friendly uh, kind of environment. So uh, we work from that consultancy space all the way through to a proof of concept into a pilot. Uh, and actually, um, we hope to see a lot of these applications actually work in production code, whether that's on the public Ethereum network uh, or through some private impl implementation. So we're really excited to partner with groups in the Bay Area, all around the world. Uh, we already have a lot of these things uh, cooking. So if you'd like to work on enterprise-related projects, if you'd like to see this stuff actually uh, you know, play out with some of the biggest players in the world, um, you know, please reach out to us. Uh, so I'm Alex. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Uh, first off, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I just moved here from Boston, and I can truly say that uh, our meetup crowd, our crypto crowd, is probably like 2% of this crowd. So it's awesome to be here. Um, I'm Ash Egan. I'm a principal with Con uh, Consensus's Venture Arm, a uh, newly established $50 million uh, Venture Arm, um, which is part of the Consensus Capital umbrella. We also offer token services, which helps companies uh, with token design and their token sale, and also uh, consensus asset management. Um, I, along with our managing partner, Kavita Gupta, are looking to partner with, um, with entrepreneurs and companies building across a range of sectors. Um, and we want the companies out there to use the benefits of the consensus ecosystem to help build uh, what's happening with blockchain. So I look forward to meeting a lot of you tonight and uh, you know, expecting an awesome night, so thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Amanda Gutterman. Um, I'm Consensus Chief Marketing Officer. Um, and I'm here to talk about an event called Ethereal. We had the first one um, in Brooklyn. It was uh, a lot of fun, it was a big success. Uh, we have another one coming up um, in San Francisco. Um, to help introduce Ethereum to the Bay Area. It's on October 27th. Um, there are tickets at etherealsummit.com, and the early bird rates are about to expire um, on Wednesday. So if you want tickets, now is a good time to grab them. We have a really great lineup of speakers that includes some great names from the blockchain and crypto ecosystem, but also starting to place Ethereum and decentralizing technologies in the context of things like AI, robotics, space travel, HI. So we have awesome people coming to speak like Peter Diamandis and Brian Johnson. Um, short video about Ethereal.
You should come join us. It'll be a lot of fun. All right. Thank you, everyone, for helping tell the consensus story. Um, we usually sponsor pizza and beer for these, but this time we have Vitalik, Joseph Poon, and June. Um, a quick show of hands, who prefers Vitalik, Joseph Poon, and June over pizza? All right, we'll, we'll keep that in mind for the next one. Real, one last quick show of hands. How many people here prior to us getting on stage had an idea of what consensus is? Wow, Holy, consensus with a Y, the company. All right, <laughs> we're doing it, it's happening. All right, awesome. All right, without further ado, take it away, Grant. Thanks, Ron. Uh, could we get another round of applause for consensus? So uh, I hope you're all ready to hear about some exciting new technologies in the decentralized space. Right here we have Jun Hasegawa, uh, head of Omise Go, which is the 11th largest cryptocurrency platform by market cap, and also a cool project. Unbanking the banked, that's their tagline, which I love. So uh, here you go. We will set your computer up right here, and yep. Testing. It's your sound good. Okay. I'm bank. There you go. The bank. Okay. <laughs> cool. Uh, oh, so what you do? Go uh, uh, oh. to your settings. Uh, uh, sir. What? S settings. Yeah. Uh, and go to displays. Right there. Oh, okay. And then That's arrangement. Amazing. And then mirror displays. Thank you for guide. Yeah. Sure thing. Right, uh, nice to meet you everyone. Uh, as for the pizza, that can I pay by OMG? <laughs> uh, I'm uh, the founder of Omise and Omise Go. Um, uh, today is, uh, the I'm warming up here. Um, and the next is uh, Joseph and also the Vitarik as uh, talking about more details and the technical stuff. So uh, first of all, I want you guys to understand what, who we are and what we're going to do. Um, so first of all, um, let me explain uh, how we started. Uh, so we are started uh, since back 2013. We are founded in uh, Bangkok and the Thailand. Uh, I and the co-founder, the two of us, the started a company called Omise. And uh, omise is uh, in Japanese uh, mean uh, store, uh, the shop. So we started as the e-commerce platform, but we facing the, some problem, uh, which was uh, the payment. Then uh, we decided to build our own payment gateway, and the payment gateway is a uh, kind of huge project. So uh, in 2014, we uh, fully pivoted to the payment company. And 2015, we started operating in Thailand and expand to the other countries. Uh, and also, we are uh, backed by the major venture capitals, uh, as you can see. And now we have uh, 130 uh, the employees and uh, more than 8,000 merchants uh, that are using our, uh, the payment platform. Uh, there's so many uh, different features, uh, payment acceptance or core banking uh, systems, uh, the others. And also we are well funded, uh, the company. So for uh, our organization structure is, uh, we have uh, Omise Holdings in uh, Singapore. Uh, and uh, under umbrella, we have uh, six uh, different region uh, payment acceptance companies. And also we have uh, Omise Go uh, in Singapore. And something else uh, is coming. Uh, I'm not on this girls. Sorry. <laughs> but something is coming. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> let me uh, explain the, some uh, love story of the Ethereum and Omise. So 
Uh, when we started uh, the OMISE payment in the 2015, uh, we have an opportunity to know uh, is uh, the Ethereum, uh, which was uh, the still like Ethereum was a very small project, and uh, we have opportunity to the contribute to dev grants. So that's how we started the relation uh, with the Ethereum Foundation. And since back then, uh, we are trying to explore how we can uh, utilize the Ethereum uh, technology to uh, fintech and a payment. Especially our main market is Southeast Asia. Uh, I don't know how much you guys know about Southeast, Southeast Asia. Uh, more than 73% of uh, the people are uh, unbanked, so uh, they don't have enough credential to open up the bank account. And, but 133% of mobile penetration and uh, 833 million uh, the mobile users uh, be able to access the internet. Which mean, actually people be able to access uh, the digital the form of the payment. Uh, so that's why uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, in 2020, more than 40% of the transaction uh, be happen uh, through the e-wallet services. So uh, that's how we uh, came, up, came up with the idea of the Omise Go, uh, the e-wallet uh, decentralized E-wallet is uh, one of like just an uh, interface, but a uh, decentralized exchange network. So it's here, the everyone uh, already is aware of uh, steering of the blockchain. Uh, this is one of uh, the big tasks for um, any the businesses that are using the blockchain. So a uh, speed and load. So. As I mentioned, uh, since back 2015, uh, we have a chance to uh, communicate with uh, Ethereum Foundation and also the core uh, people, uh, the, such as uh, the Vitarik and Joseph, and uh, they, they gave us so, so many uh, different ideas. Also, uh, uh, the, one of the big things is uh, Plasma, right? Uh, by the way, it's uh, my dog uh, name as a plasma, <laughs> uh, the golden retriever, you know. It's a very, very cute and super fast. And <laughs> I, I hope it's, uh, he's gonna grow as super fast. Yeah. Uh, so uh, actually the Vitarik, uh, actually the, uh, talk about uh, at the TechCrunch disrupt today, uh, what, what is like CR really? Um, and uh, it's, there's like TechCrunch uh, misleading <laughs> some, and some, some people uh, uh, the seeing the Twitter, I guess. <laughs> but um, Plasma scalability uh, be able to exceed uh, the visa, uh, the peak uh, transaction TPS, uh, which is uh, 50, 56,000 TPS. Uh, actually, this is a kind of very high uh, TPS, and the uh, reason why uh, because uh, the Omise is uh, dealing with uh, so many, a million of the million of transactions in Southeast Asia for the credit card scheme. And uh, we never seen uh, this number yet. <laughs> uh, I hope we will. But um, this number will uh, be able to support a credit card uh, scheme number, but uh, not be able to support uh, the cash transaction. So that's why the plasma is very important. And uh, plasma, uh, the potential, it's one million TPS. And this, is, this number uh, should be able to support in the, all uh, the cash transaction in this world at this moment. So our solutions uh, to, to the aspect, uh, the one, is uh, Omisego decentralizing exchange uh, based on the POS, uh, proof of stake, and a robust, stable decentralized exchange DEX, we call DEX, and network. This is uh, com compatible the, across the organization and geographic borders. Um, and for fast phase, uh, we wanna 
build uh, the interface chat, uh, which is a white label wallet, wallet as SDK. The easy to implement uh, and uh, break the old silo uh, between the, uh, the wallets. The basic feature is uh, basically for uh, the different uh, features, exchange, the liquidity, and payment and acceptance. Uh, the reason why we are a little bit unique, uh, let me explain. So I actually uh, the wrote uh, some blog recently uh, about we have a three different layers. Uh, how we differentiate ourselves and the why is uh, it has a value. Uh, since back 2015, we are operating across the four regions in Southeast Asia and building the online to the offline acceptance. So which mean once Omise Go network is ready, uh, whoever owns the Omise Go network uh, be able to pay at any acceptance uh, uh, implemented Omise payment and online and to the offline. And also uh, through our customer network as well. Because uh, automatically, it's all like Omise customer uh, is going to onboard uh, with uh, uh, Omise Go network. However, uh, one of the, uh, our the homework is uh, decentralized cash in cash out layer, because uh, still like people's uh, the receiving uh, the fiat currency and they need to uh, digitize their cash into uh, any digital form asset, and how that's a, one of one of uh, the big tasks for us. And uh, actually, we are working on. Uh, this uh, with the couple, uh, the world class uh, the agent, and also uh, some fun financial institution to providing us a touch point for end user. So ultimately, uh, people be able to cash in to their wallet uh, and digitize any asset to to uh, their wallet services. And this uh, the wallet should uh, the work across uh, the any wallet and pay out any uh, acceptance. So uh, this is our milestone. Uh, so we've done the cross sale and also like we um, almost like fulfilled all like stuffing uh, at uh, the phase one. So uh, we already actually uh, started build um, pretty much the we started a lot, we've done a lot. Uh, I hope we can disclose soon uh, the, what we are working on. And also, uh, the one, one of the things we are observing is we really want accelerating uh, the community and also this ecosystem. And uh, we are uh, working with a couple partners to open up uh, the co-working space uh, to touch the, all like the platform, and also uh, getting funding and getting the team up, and uh, also uh, basically like it's accelerator programs, uh, and we already started uh, the working for uh, the co-working space in Tokyo, and also the Bangkok. Uh, so in the 2018, uh, oh, sorry, it's in end of 2017. Uh, first phase is a wallet SDK the, for a uh, hosted wallet. Um, we have an uh, uh, investor uh, who owns a huge penetration uh, of e-wallet. And uh, they, they have a, a their, their uh, Thailand e-wallet and the provider, and they have a 50, uh, almost 60% of the e-wallet penetration. And they're already decided to uh, go with us. So that's a, one of a very a strong use case. And uh, in the 2018, uh, Prasmar work ongoing, and uh, some is, uh, I cannot explain detail in here, but uh, uh, stay tuned for uh, our blog. And uh, so 2019, also we, uh, going to provide an aquarium house and all the uh, blinding and the mobile light client. Uh, 
That's it. <laughs> All right. Uh, thanks, Jun. If Joseph could come on stage. Hi everyone, I'm Joseph Jun. Oh, thank you, I love you all too. Um, I'm Joseph Poon. Um, I'm presenting about plasma. Um, the paper was released recently. Um, I'm a co-author along with Vitalik. Um, so in order to really like, so this presentation is sort of going to be more of a high level but a little bit technical overview. Um, perhaps tomorrow I'll talk a little bit more about the economic motivations about this, behind like, the economic mechanisms behind this um, at the Palo Alto uh, or the Silicon Valley um, Ethereum meetup. Um, so in order to really understand the motivations behind Plasma, I think you need to understand um, sort of the background and sort of the narrative of um, you know, what, what the problems are and how we go about trying to solve that. Uh, so as we all may know, blockchain relies upon, you know, multiple parties coming to agreement about the state of the world. And the security is derived from the principle that you don't really trust what other people tell you about the world. You trust um, what you, you yourself can verify. And as a result, um, if everybody else does this at once, that creates a huge degree of computational load. It's sort of a feature of the system, and that requires you to fully validate everything relevant to yourself. So if the relevant, activi the relevant activity is who has uh, what amount of money, uh, you may need to verify that entire set within that context. And that results in upper bounds when it comes to the on-chain capacity, right? the amount of uh, entries on the ledger, for example. And this is especially magnified with computation, because if you want to you know, compute many, many things about the world, for example, you know, stuff that is normally computed in large-scale data centers, well, then everyone needs to run, therefore run a large-scale data center as the traditional way of uh, resolving this problem. Uh, there's an emerging narrative um, with channels, lightning, and you know, other, other, other developments to minimize the amount of global validation. Uh, if the blockchain is the ground truth, then let's minimize the amount of truth that we need to verify and move that as much as possible to individual parties. Um, so if, you know, um, instead of everybody verifying a payment, perhaps two people can verify a payment and then they can net settle later on. Uh, the issue when it comes to this is that now you have a disparity between who has what information. Uh, and when you disagree about global consensus, that's effectively, you know, what, what you know, some people colloquially describe as insanity, right? You disagree about the state of the world. Um, either you're insane or someone else is insane, or perhaps you both are, right? Or maybe nobody is. Um, and when you want to do that, right, um, on a technical level, uh, you're dealing with state synchronization along multiple participants. Um, there's a need to enforce the current state. And with global data, it's easy, right? Everybody has all the data, so you can verify all the data. Uh, when not everybody has all the data, there needs to be mechanisms which you need to design front-loaded into the system in order to account for that. And the most complex aspects is withdrawals um, back into the system, the global system. And that's, that's, uh, that becomes intuitively obvious because you, know, you and I can agree on something but, uh, or disagree on something. But it's really only when you go back to the global state that it becomes an issue, right? Like it's sort of like we can both sock money into a mattress, and we can argue about who who has what in the whose money is in the mattress, and you know it's very friendly until one of us starts reaching for the money, right? If one of us starts reaching for the money, then then the argument really starts, right? So you have to it's the withdrawals back into the current state, into the global state, which is the primary relevant aspect. And within this context, data availability is the hardest part. Um, because if you want to prove fraudulent activity, um, making those proofs, which are computationally verifiable, require evidence. Uh, if the blockchain is the adjudication layer, uh, evidence is the foundation for attestation in the global court system. 
So on background, uh, we can go into you know the Lightning Network. This is not a presentation on Lightning. You can you know t watch prior presentations about this state channels, etc. Um, but I think it's foundational to understanding how Plasma works. Um, the conceptual underpinning for Lightning and channels in general is that you have on-chain activity, but with on-chain off-chain activity, but with on-chain enforcement. That means that all the activity is bonded on-chain and pre-committed on-chain. So for example, if you and I wish to conduct some type of financial activity off-chain, we pre-commit some amount of funds and say, we're going to settle these funds between you and I at a later date for some amounts, but right now it can only go up to that value. Um, and ultimately it's enforceable if there's any disagreement because we both have signed proofs, so only the most current state is valid, so that when we do the withdrawal back into the main chain, um, that technically it's not a withdrawal, but I'm going to call it that for conceptual understanding. Um, then you, you sort of have, uh, you know, a proof that that is the amount that you should have. And if there's an incorrect aspect, if there's an incorrect commitment, then, um, then there's a penalty for the person that is incorrectly making the commitment, similar to how the judicial system works. Um, on a technical level, the mechanism for this is two-party synchronicity. Um, so that means that you know, there is the global state of the blockchain, and you have two parties that, that have synchronicity between them. That means that you have both parties, but in order to move forward, they must um, sign off on it. So for example, if they commit one Ether um, then between the two of them, and let's say Alice and Bob has 0.5.5, in order to update the new state, they must have a copy of the new state in order for it to properly move forward. Now, this, this resolves a lot of the data availability problems because it's these two participants that agree, need to agree, and they two, they, as a result, they both are fully, not you know, perfectly synchronous at the same time, but in order to, for the uh, updated state to be finalized, they must have synchronicity in the eventual sense. And, uh, and under that construction, the data availability problem can be mitigated between those two parties, provided that there's block availability. However, under this context, if you want to expand this to computation, the complexity dramatically increases. Um, under the channel model, the construction works fine if you wanted the synchronicity between two participants. But what if you wanted synchronicity, or at least understanding um, uh, eventual synchronicity between, let's say, thousands or even millions of participants? it's going to be very, very difficult to move your state forward from A to B, state A to state B, uh, computational state at least, uh, the state transitions. Um, in order to do that, um, you need these thousand parties to have a copy or these million parties to have a copy. Um, the, assurance com uh, the assurance complexity increases uh, dramatically. Um, so additionally, there's issues around you know, uh, liveness constraints where, you know, not a million people are going to be online, but you're going to be commu computing on states involving a million people or a million agents. Um, additionally, there's um, complex incentives against halting the system. And additionally, you, know, you want to be able to scale the root blockchain. And this directly relates to you know, liveness constraints. But at the root of it all, the data availability problem permeates all of these issues. Um, you, you, you know, like there, there's, there's a problem of you know, moving state off, but you know, it's, the problem becomes dramatically simpler if you're able to prove current state. And my assertion is, is that while there are solutions that can mitigate the problem, um, my personal goal is to sort of assume that data availability will be somewhat lossy. And of course, with sharding work, perhaps that can reduce the problem space for a specific problem set. But I think there are some problem sets if you want to reach you know, million x scalability, that this is sort of the relevant problem set to think about. Um, this is the fundamental problem to think about when you have you know, an issue where not everybody has all the data at the same time. So what is Plasma? Plasma is a construction of blockchains and blockchains, and states of these child blockchains are committed to the root blockchain. And functionally, what it is on a physical construction on the root blockchain is just a set of smart contracts. Uh, you can write this in Solidity, for example. Um, the P2P layer, of course, on the individual uh, you know, nodes need to have software. But ultimately, the enforcement is done on the blockchain um, 
when it comes to withdrawals, when it comes to understanding and reasoning about the current state. Um, and additionally, if there are any incorrect states, um, anyone on the system can attest to it and prove it using fraud proofs, provided they, ha they have the data available. Um, additionally, in order to do these types of computations in a highly scalable manner, it's framed as um, MapReduce, but with um, commitments, Merkleized commitments, in order to prove invalid state transitions. And uh, this, is, this construction is compatible with on-chain scaling solutions, as, such as sharding and other possible emerging areas of research. So the idea is if sharding can give you, you know, some X increase, this can run as a layer on top to give you an additional X increase. Um, the interesting thing about this is that, you know, uh, post-Metropolis, this doesn't require any changes to Ethereum. Um, you can run a basic version today if, it, if it's written and be able to scale, you know, millions of transactions per second um, if, you know, the, the design is fully complete. Uh, so the design goals of Plasma is that one blockchain can encompass all of the world's trend, uh, computation, which is composable under a MapReduce framework. And uh, data is committed, so a very, very small amount of data is committed to the root blockchain, and it's only in the event of you know, disputes of Byzantine behavior that the fraud is proven and that, um, that child block is rolled back. Um, and the goal of this is to really minimize trust um, the primary risk is left is around chain halting, block space availability, and ideally is mitigated with both good parent chain selection as well as economic incentives using tokens, which I can go into tomorrow. Um, and um, additionally, there's significant um, benefits when it comes to payment and ledger scalability. Um, channels don't necessarily give you that because you still need to be making an on-chain commitment in creation and withdrawal. Um, and exit, basically. Um, so at the minimum, you have two transactions that hit the chain. So potentially, you know, if you wanted to store um, very, very small amounts or a high degree of, of um, ledger entries, that that can, um, you know, this, this is designed to solve. Um, and, you know, you can run channels on top of Plasma. So perhaps the stack is, you know, channels, um, Plasma, um, and then root blockchain. Uh, if sharding comes in and then it expands the root blockchain, Plasma runs on top and then, um, and then channels can make instantaneous transactions feasible. Um, so what is sort of uh, Plasma? Like I said earlier, it's functionally a set of smart contracts. So you can run many types of smart contracts on top of this. It's, a, it's sort of a framework or library. Um, and you put in your business logic into it and as a result, you have a specific use case that runs a blockchain on top of another blockchain. And this, this allows you to have localized computation because let's say you know, you're only interested in a blockchain that involves you know, um, some social network app that you're using. You may not be paying attention to the decentralized exchange that someone, some other people are running and you only see minimized data hitting the root blockchain. So as a result, you only need to observe you know, the things you care about, and other people enforce the things that they care about. And the enforcement is run by fraud proofs written in the smart contract in order to allow anyone who has the block available to be able to prove that the block is invalid and it can be rolled back. We'll go into that later on how, uh, a very, very high level overview of how it works. Um, and, you know, like I said, there's unique rules per chain. And the goal is decentralized applications at extremely high scale whereby you can perhaps run you know, millions to billions of state updates with very, 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 very low fees because only small amounts of data are hitting the chain and you know, it's, it's highly efficient in that context. So to make the picture a little bit bigger, um, you, know, you have different um, contracts serving different you know, business cases that you plug into it. Um, the more interesting thing I think within this context is running a private chain on top of a public chain you know, it, it's sort of you know the internet internet dynamic, whereby you know you can see Ethereum as the internet, and you have you know people running their own private chain or private business logic running on top of that, and this sort of is better to reason about because running a private chain uh, as the root is sort of role playing, because ultimately one guy is determining and running the system. So if you run into any trouble, you just go to that guy, and that guy can do whatever they want, right? Um, it's sort of just like playing house. 
Um, but instead, for, for something like this, it's sort of real, whereby it's a private system running uh, enforced by a public system. So you're will willing to join into this because you know it's a public system enforcing it. And you know they can't change the rules of the game and take all your money, for example. Um, so how does the mechanism work, right? Um, so after you initialize the smart contract, uh, what you do then is periodically, whoever is creating the blocks, and it can be you know, primarily two types of situations, you know, proof of authority, whereby you delegate a single person to create the blocks. You know, they, only one signature is allowed. Um, that's sort of you know, the private chain example. But I think a more interesting uh, case is a public system, right? So I, someone that, for example, owns some of the tokens can say, um, you know, I have the right to, collect, to produce some n number of blocks or, you know, some type of, you know, proof of stake system. Um, in, in the short term, you know, this is conceptually proof of stake on proof of work. Um, and what this gets you is that you can have a public open system determined by the token holders, you know, who, who gets to create the blocks, economically incentivized to continue operating the system. And um, what they do is they just submit a small amount of data to the blockchain. What they say is, okay, here's the block hash, here's the signature, we made a new block, and I have the right to make a new block. So we're talking about, you know, 100 bytes, low 100 bytes. Um, and that can encompass, you know, potentially millions of state transition in one block. Um, so you have 100 bytes producing, you know, maybe perhaps gigabytes of data, lots and lots of computation. Now, this is very different than um, proof of existence designs, whereby, you know, you, you, take some, you take some data, you merkleize and it hash it and post to the blockchain. This is materially different because this is dealing with state transitions, which is computationally enforceable. What that means is, is that if what is committed on the blockchain is incorrect and someone else has the block data, they can take that data and prove it's incorrect and enforce it. And we'll go into later on, on you know, visually how that works. Um, and as a result, um, you can have a huge amount of computation and um, you know, the, the, there's, there's sort of the, available, um, uh, the availability to do that stuff at a, uh, at a low cost. However, data availability is needed to prove this fraud, right? If you don't have the data available, you can't prove that someone has been fraudulent. And this has historically always been the issue when it comes to you know, not having all the, all the data globally, like I said earlier. Um, this is a bigger picture. So you know, Alice, in this case, has all her money allocated inside the plasma, plasma block chain, right? And in the root chain, you just see a pool of all the money in the smart contracts. So on the root chain, if you're only observing Ethereum, you don't actually see who owns what money inside this plasma chain. It's inside the plasma chain itself. Whenever you update a block, you just update the root hash, and then everybody inside this network has the updated block. And if they don't have the updated block, then you, then you just exit, and I'll go into that later. Um, so what happens when a block hash is submitted to Ethereum? and it's incorrect, right? Let's say either it's a proof of authority system or you know, it's some proof of stake system running on top of Ethereum. And oh wow, it's actually in this case where Alice had one ETH. Well, now it says Bob has this ETH or you know, in this case, let's say Mallory has this ETH. And Mallory, she, uh, she didn't include a signature in this and Alice never signed off on it. And in the root chain, it's this giant pool of money. What do you do, right? Clearly this shouldn't happen and Mallory shouldn't be able to withdraw the money. So if there is block data available, so let's say you know, um, someone produces block number four, it, it sends money to someone that it shouldn't send to, and the block is propagated in, the, in this Plasma blockchain P2P network um, for anyone observing it, um, proving fraud only in entry and exit is insufficient. So there's a lot of designs. Um, so this is materially different from you know, federated peg sidechains, right? Um, federated peg sidechains assume that you know, state transitions are enforced. And the, the presumption is, is that you know, e, in, even only in the most optimistic case that you know, entry and exit is enforced, right? But entry and exit doesn't matter if state transitions are incorrect. So what happens when there's an invalid state transition? 
Well, in this case, um, the way Plasma is designed is that if there's an invalid state transition, because all state transitions are Merkleized and provable, um, anyone who observes it, let's say Alice, Alice goes, oh, wow, uh, my money is gone. She can, she can publish a proof on the root chain, and what happens is, is that block gets rolled back. So, and then what happens is whoever published that invalid block gets heavily penalized. So not only are they not successful if they propagate the block, and they, they lose a lot of money, so they have a lot of incentive not to do that. So, and if you're an individual, you have an incentive to do that because you know, your money is in there, so you're gonna publish this. You can also delegate a third party to watch on your behalf. Um, and there's going to be incentive for, you know, for a lot of people in cooperation with miners to disclose this in order to get rewarded for publishing this. So because of these penalties, you're probably not going to want to take a block, you know, to, to generate a block that's invalid and propagate it out. However, there's this problem where if you cannot get the block data, what do you do, right? If you're an attacker and you know that if you ever propagate an invalid block, you're going to get penalized for it. Why not just not propagate the block? You can always just submit a root hash, uh, a block hash, and then submit it to the root chain. Um, so in order to resolve that, um, the core novelty around Plasma is to exit when there's malicious behavior by the participants in the Plasma blockchain. Um, you know, it's sort of like if a party starts sucking, you should get out, right? I don't, you know, that's, that's, that's really like the thesis of Plasma, right? That's all it is, <laughs> right? So, so it's designing, the, it's pre-designing the smart contracts so that, oh yeah, the party's starting to suck, let's go, right? And it's allowing you to be able to do that when the party starts sucking. And when I say the party starts sucking, it could be they start doing a lot of these hostile activities, they start doing block withholding attacks, or they start halting the system or censoring the system, right? It could be a, system, a situation where like, hey, I wanna pay Bob, and, and then like the operator of the plasma chain says, yeah, I'm gonna pretend I never got that. You can't prove that, right? You can't prove that kind of censorship reliably. Like you can probabilistically prove it or have a third party oracle, but you really can't do it, right? Like it's not an easy problem to solve. And I would argue that that is basically close to impossible. Um, it, there are solutions that you can work around where you can like prove that censorship is happening, but in a particular case, you can't say, oh, I want this transaction in and then like, you know, not, not be able to resolve that. Um, you know, I could be wrong. There could be ways to go about this, but um, as far as I can tell right now, the simplest solution is to just pre-design it so that if anyone is doing things like censorship, if anyone's doing things like halting the system, that you're able to get your money out. And when I say halting the system, it's just like someone starts, stops producing blocks, right? Um, you should be able to withdraw your money. And really, like, this is, you know, this is the core insight where it's, you know, if there is, you know, this invalid block going on here. Can you see my mouse move? Yeah, yeah right? Okay, cool. Um, I'm, I'm, if, if the resolution's not high enough, I'm sort of like circling my mouse around the red block. Um, so, oh yeah, actually I should just make it bigger. Um, so in this case, you know, if there's block number four is withheld from anyone and you can't produce a fraud proof, Alice broadcasts a transaction on the root chain that says, I want my money out. And then some dispute mediation game starts, you know, some dispute mediation mechanism starts. However, you know, they need to broadcast on a higher chain. And in order to make that economically efficient, Perhaps you should nest these chains together. That way there's greater block space availability. You know, if the third tree depth starts acting hostile or the second tree depth, you go up to the second or go up to the first. That way you can exit your money in a higher place. And you're creating a tree of block chains. And this gives you block space availability and easier fault recovery in the event of Byzantine behavior. Additionally, we can frame this as computational scaling as well. Um, what this can get you is that if you're constructing things in a tree, you can distribute work in a tree. Um, and that gives you, um, and if you align the economic incentives for the distributing out, that gives you the ability to um, align incentives for continue operation as well. Um, in these 
in this tree, they send their commitments of their new blocks up the tree, so that even if you have a thousand child blocks below you, um, in non-Byzantine and cooperative behavior where they're maximizing their returns, um, and they can be selfishly maximizing their returns, only one commitment goes into the root chain. So you could have thousands of blocks updating with one commitment to the root chain. And that's really how you're going to be able to get you know, potentially millions or even billions of state updates per second. So visually, what this looks like is that if there is some type of fault, um, you know, let's say the second tree depth in red, um, just let's say in this case halts, right? In this case, they just go offline and they stop operating. And if you're Alice, you're like, whoa, 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 all my money is in the third tree depth, but the third tree depth you know, is, is on top of the second tree depth. What do you do, right? So you can transition and broadcast the mass transition from the, from the second into a different place. And that can be economically efficient because the state update is, again, in this case, updated on the root chain in a very small commitment. Um, if they all fail down the line, then ultimately you will have to broadcast on the root chain. Um, so you may want to have a lot of disparate participants if you're holding very small balances or having you know, certain types of state transitions. Um, but you don't need to as be as concerned if you have correct chain selection. You, know, you can run this perhaps like 30, 20 levels deep. So it's sort of like one of 20 only needs to be available. Um, in order to do this economically efficient. If it all fails, you go to the root chain, broadcast your transaction there. Um, and there can be mechanisms in the future designed to sort of ensure orderly exits in the event of you know, the root chain starts getting a little bit congested. Um, so the fun part of this, if you're a user, uh, especially a light client user, is that you don't need to be watching all of the plasma chains. If you're not even paying attention to this particular chain, you don't care what happens, right? It, you have no money in here. You're not economically incentivized to watch it. Who cares, right? You're no, you don't care about the computation going on inside. But let's say you are. Um, even within a single plasma, you know, set of plasma blockchains, um, you only need to watch the things that affect you. Um, there are some computations where you need to watch at all of the child blockchains. But in many of the situations, you only need to watch the ones that matter to you. So for example, let's say this is handling payments. Or a, and it's basically a ledger for payments. Um, you and your funds are in the third tree depth on the right. You only need to watch that a plasma chain and its parents' plasma chain and the root chain in order to ensure that the commitments are happening correctly. Um, if the commitments happen incorrectly on other sides, you sort of don't care, right? So it's like, oh great, if it's any anything bad happened over there, it's sort of not my business. I know my money is good on the third tree depth, on the second tree depth, and the first tree depth accounts for the amount of money on the second tree depth. So it's sort of like on the one which matters to you. And if the other ones sort of like go haywire, you don't care. So as a result, um, you only watch the ones that matter to you. And for the ones on the other chains, the users of those or the outsourced computation or watching um, is only managed by those people that matter to them. So, or watch the chains that matter to them. So you have all these like nested chains going on, and there's a lot of activity. Um, how do you really reason about distributed computing? Well, distributed computing was you know um, one of the one of the biggest people that like have these problems is Google, and they they created something a while back, like over ten years ago, called MapReduce, and it's a way to reason about splitting up work to computers. So MapReduce is a very simple idea conceptually. Uh, it's 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 Basically, you have a piece of code that says how you split up the work, and then another piece of code that says how do you combine all the work together to be able to come to the result. And a lot of different algorithms have been shown to you know, be able to use MapReduce from like sorting, number counting, whatever it may be when it comes to you know, computational primitives, um, when it comes to distributed computing. Uh, you know, when you arrange things in a nested tree, um, it's functionally similar. You're, you're, you're mapping out work across the blockchains, and then you're reducing it out to a single result. Um, uh, and in this case, it's the commitment. Right? Uh, the canonical example for MapReduce is dealing with word counts. Um, I'll go into that a little bit, but I can also talk about how conceptually you can use this to build a decentralized exchange. Uh, you know, the canonical example for word count is you just like, Let's say you have the Library of Congress, you want to split up the work, so you say, okay, the map function is 
you have the Library of Congress, you split up the work for books, so each of them like, gets assigned books, and after that they each get assigned chapters, and then they read the amount of words in that chapter and the number of times that word occurs. So for example, the comes up like 15 times, hello comes up three times, and they take that, and then in the reduce step they combine that and combine that and combine that so that now you have a full word list of the entire world, uh, of the entire Library of Congress. Um, the difference here is that we're adding in Merkleized commitments on both the map step and the reduce step so that if any of these steps are incorrectly computed, anyone observing the system and cares about the results can you know, reason about it and understand and prove that there's fraud happening in the computation and be able to roll it back and recompute it. So here's an example of the map phase on the left and the reduce phase on the right. So on the left side, you sort of see the work being split up. Uh, I should have two on the right side. Anyway, um, conceptually, you just reduce, combine, 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 so that you know you have a full word list. So you get assigned, you know, deeper in there. Um, I think a decentralized exchange is sort of a great example of why this is applicable and how you can do orders of magnitude higher volume than any exchange that exists today on the blockchain. A lot of people say blockchains don't scale. I believe that you can design a construction which is more scalable than any financial system operating today. Um, and you know, of course you can design a financial centralized financial system under this model as well. But you know, conceptually, um, you, know, you can solve a lot of problems under this reasoning, under this framework, and ultimately have a very small commitment on the root chain. Um, so conceptually, let's say, I don't have any slides here, I'm just sort of like winging it, so you know, you may have to visualize in your head what's going on. Um, so, oh crap. Um, so let's say you have funds here in the third tree depth, right, on the top right. Um, and let's say you want to exchange um, ETH to some ERC20 token. Um, and in this case, you issue an order to the third tree depth, and let's say you want this order to go globally, whereby everybody inside this plasma chain um, nets the orders together, and you're able to do that, and able to um, able to I mean matches the orders together, and you're able to get the best price, and that's your goal because you want you're doing a big order and you want deep liquidity. So you place an order, and in the most recent block in in the plasma blockchain on the third tree depth, you take all the orders coming in. And then you combine them together, and this is the reduce step. So you start off with a reduce step, and then you send it to the parent blockchain. The parent blockchain at the second tree depth takes all its children and combines it together into a single order book. Basically, you're, you're, you're taking an order book, combining the order book together, and sending it up. And ultimately, when you have it at the top, you have a full order book of all of the child blockchains uh, at the step above you. So for example, if you have, let's say, 10, 10 child chains at the second tree depth, you have 10 order books, right? You match them all together, and that's going to be basically, imagine if 10 people just put in orders. Um, and then you see what matches, so you do the cross, and then you commit to it on the root chain, and then you feed it back up. So on the, when, and then this is, the, this is a map step, whereby you tell the children, hey, here's the orders that are filled, and here's what you get. And then the child chain at the second tree depth then says, okay, this is the one that goes to the third tree depth, this is the one that goes to the third tree depth, so you feed it back up again, okay? Back to the third tree depth, and it says, okay, these are the orders that executed. And now Alice, if your order executed at your price, you then have the cross that occurs, or have the, have the match that occurs, and then the orders sort of fill, and now you have, instead of one ETH, you have you know, some ERC20 token. And then that gets committed, and then it gets, committed to the root chain, and now you have, you know, it's sort of a reduce, map, reduce. Um, and now you have an order, uh, an order that's filled. And you could see how you could potentially do millions of orders per second, and even millions of executions per second, because you're matching, really, entire order books down to a root chain. And that's, how, that's sort of how you go about that, and how to reason about this. Now, let's say you want higher performance, um, you can have the third tree depth only compute the execution locally, and as a result, you'll get very, very fast execution with a trade-off of you know, price and liquidity. Um, but that's kind of fun because you sort of trade time 
when it comes to liquidity. So you can be like, oh, I'm doing a small order. Let's just compute it locally on the third tree depth with the other people computing it on the third tree depth. Um, or if you were doing like a massive order, you can compute it all down so you get the liquidity on everyone else. Um, so you can, you, know, you can have something that you know, does you know, potentially like you know, very, very fast computation or very, very liquid. Um, so that's sort of like how to reason about this, and that's an example application. Other example applications can be like, you know, you put Reddit on this thing or something like that. Um, and then you, you just have like, you know, the second tree depth have each subreddit, and each one below that is a post. So each post is an individual blockchain, and you update comments and stuff like that. Um, and that's how, sort of how you reach scalability on that end. And if you don't care about the other subreddits, you don't read them, right? Like that was like the earlier where certain things were highlighted in blue and grayed out. So it's sort of you don't care about the computation going on and other stuff. This is feasible enough to do, you know, um, storage and state transitions, right? Where you can, you know, upload data, enforce it, enforce the data, do state transitions, and then, and then you have, you know, whatever it is you want to do, whether it be some social network. So when it comes to future work, um, there's mechanism improvement, creating more incentive for correct, correct exits. Um, you want to minimize block withholding attacks incentives. Um, the holy grail is sort of recursive ZK snarks or starks. Um, this is not for privacy, it's actually to make proofs. Um, and could possibly provide mitigations around withheld fraudulent state transitions. Um, and it minimizes the need for exit timing mechanisms, so a lot of the exit proofs can get potentially smaller and faster. Um, additionally, token incentives and proof of stake design. Um, and you, know, you want to be able to create plasma blocks. In many cases, it's either a proof of stake validator set by token holders or proof of authority. Um, and the token incentives can be iterated. I can go into that more tomorrow. Um, but the main, the main thing that needs to be worked on is sort of the incentives around uh, block withholding. So there's, there's the ability to exit, but there needs to be more mechanisms to disincentivize that. Um, that doesn't mean the system doesn't work. It's that you, know, you want to disincentivize Byzantine behavior as much as possible, and it can be further disincentivized. So the goal is to use the root blockchain sort of as a supreme court. Um, you could say the highest level child chain is the district court. Um, the ones below that are sort of the, court, the appeals court, the appellate, uh, appellate court. And ultimately, the root blockchain says, i.e., in this case, Ethereum, is the ultimate root source of truth and the ultimate source of you know, smart contract enforcement. Um, not every case goes to the Supreme Court. It's only very, very few. And ideally, the system is designed so that you can do efficient computation on the higher levels and then ultimately gets committed down to the root chain, but it's only in the event of disputes across the line that you need to be able to ultimately go to the ultimate court, in this case, Ethereum. So um, this gets you high volume, low cost, decentralized applications. Um, you know, I think there's multiple strategies, right? I think, like I said earlier, you're gonna have channels, you're gonna have Plasma scaling it up using smart contracts, and ideally you have the root chain also increasing its capacity. Um, but hopefully my goal here is sort of convey that a path forward is possible, and a path forward is possible in the near term. And you know, what we're working on is sort of a long-term project, right? In order to realize what we want, can maybe take five years, 10 years, right? But this shows that you can be able to fulfill many, many applications and have it scale worldwide to be able to serve everyone's needs for specific applications. Um, we're talking about the capacity to serve billions of users, billions of computers. And you know, when someone says, oh, blockchain can't you know, be the world computer, I really think it can. I really think there's a, there's a future where we can really come to agreement and, and in a decentralized way and create you know, a third path forward when it comes to institutions. You know. Traditionally, we like centralized institutions, and doing it in a de de decentralized way, uh, the narrative has always been, well, that can't scale. And I think you could sort of have both worlds, where you, you can decentralize you know, trusted entities um, and also be able to have serve everybody. Um, so hopefully, you know, the goal of what we're working on is, in my view, to resolve many of the problems around the principal agent problem. Um, whereby you are delegating authority to central authorities. 
um, the traditional narrative has always been, um, you know, well, life is nasty, brutish, and short. Um, therefore, we need um, we need authorities. Right? It's the Leviathan, right? Hobbes. Um, and then you know the narrative became well. We sort of need to check on those authorities. We need we need an understanding that you know this authority is not going to abuse its power. Hence, we need an open social contract. Um, and in order to do that, um, well, we have this agreement, and we have trusted entities, and well, we sort of enforce them somehow. And you know the the narrative of smart contracts from the beginning, and you know the the, the vision of Ethereum, and you know what what you know. Vitalik and everybody in this community has been espousing is about the idea that you can get around this principal agent problem by having everyone, every principal also be the agent. You know, whatever computation or whatever action you want to take in the world, you are also participating in that action and you're also verifying it. Um, and that, that, that can get around the issue where you, know, you, you give authority to you know, central actors such as governments or central actors such as you know, chief executives and companies or even the board of directors. And in this case, you are, you are validating the computation that matters to you and enforcing it as well. And um, the goal is to be able to do that in a manner that can scale up to the entire world. And um, I hope this is you know, perhaps one way to think about it. And the contribution is primarily, you know, if a party starts to suck, get the heck out. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Joseph. Uh, that was an awesome speech. Uh, could Vitalik and June please come on the stage? All right, thanks guys. Uh, I don't think our next speaker needs much of an introduction. Um, Vitalik Buterin, creator of Ethereum. Uh, <laughs> he has a very professional shirt on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, excellent. Uh, so uh, yeah, without further ado, here's Vitalik. Thanks. Yeah, so um, I uh, w wanted to give a uh, kind of brief uh, version of a presentation I've made in more academic contexts um, a couple of times. And this is focusing primarily on another kind of Ethereum scaling, which is basically increasing the base capacity of the Ethereum blockchain itself. Right? So, and particularly in some of the technical challenges that arise if you try to create a blockchain that goes beyond what, what, what uh, the transaction capacity that any, any one computer can handle. Right? So this applies to things like merge mining, this applies to any kind of multi-blockchain solutions, this applies to you know, any kind of IOTA style system, this applies to just any kind of system that tries to uh, create multi-blockchains, like sub-chains, side-chains, you know, like short, uh, sharded chains, like just any kind of, you know, like any kind of uh, massive on-chain capacity increase. 
right? So there are generally several different challenges that are involved there, but as uh, Joseph may have briefly mentioned, the data availability problem is probably one of the more serious ones. So um, just to kind of introduce the mathematical model here, a simple, for a simple, everyone probably is familiar with what a simple blockchain looks like. You have blocks. Each block contains transactions. Anyone here not know what a transaction is? And each, and we're going to assume that each block and each transaction is small enough, or that e or sorry, that each block is small enough that any single node in the network can still process the entire blockchain. Right. So we're going to use this kind of big O notation abstraction of C to refer to the computing power slash storage slash bandwidth of any individual node. And we're going to say that a simple blockchain will have a transaction capacity that's also O of C, so that the amount of computational storage and bandwidth load that any particular node incurs is also going to be O of C. Right? So this is probably like, this is not scalable, right? But you know, this is a way of doing things, and it's a blockchain and it works. Now, there are taking this as a starting point, there are a few incomplete scaling paradigms that work okay, but they have a lot of problems to them. So we'll start with the very simple one, super big blocks. Um, so, you know, obviously there are always gains that you can make by, by just bumping up parameters, and you know, even the Ethereum blockchain itself, we uh, increase the capacity by, by about 40% recently when miners voted the gas limit up from about 4.7 million to about 6.7 million. So capacity and just simple parameter tweaks like as capacity increases definitely have their very important place. But if you try to push them far as the only scaling paradigm, then you run, to, run into this problem. If you increase the transaction capacity of a simple blockchain from C to 1,000 times C, then the amount of load needed to be a validator also goes up from C to 1,000 times C. And if in your model C is the amount of uh, capacity that a regular node can handle, then basically what you're saying is that the only nodes are going to run in data centers. So this gives you scalability at the cost of decentralization. Here is another incomplete scaling paradigm. And this is probably the scaling paradigm that, this, that the crypto space has kind of de facto adopting at least uh, temporarily over the last six months without even realizing it. Um, so how many people have sent a Bitcoin transaction recently? Transaction fees are a bit high, right? How many people have sent an Ethereum transaction recently? Transaction fees are much lower, but you know, they're, still, you know, they're still higher than they were half a year ago. How many people have sent a Dogecoin transaction recently? <laughs> well, the transaction fees on Dogecoin are a lot lower. Right? This is a scaling paradigm. So network capacity goes up from C to 1,000 times C. The validator load is still C, because every single person only needs to generally runs a node on one blockchain, or maybe a couple of blockchains. But so what are we trading off here? Well, the answer is pretty simple, right? Each chain has 1,000 times lower security. So if we have an ecosystem where the um, total amount of, let's say, mining hardware is, is $10 billion, then if before it would cost, uh, let's say, let's say the total amount of mining hardware is $2 billion, if before it would cost $2 billion to do a 51% attack, if this is the capacity is evenly distributed, then the cost of 51% attack goes down from $2 billion to $2 million. So getting scalability, keeping decentralization, but sacrificing security. Now merge mining, so this is a kind of proof of work only approach, but the general idea here is that you have 1,000 altcoins, but miners can mine many of them at the same time. You know, the problem is this is actually basically just like a pick and choose between the last two ideas. So if my, every miner mines every single altcoin, then what you really have is you still have a system where the required capacity for, of a node is basically 1,000 times C. 
if every node if every node mines an, or every miner mines in every altcoin, then to be a miner you would still need a data center. Or if you don't have that, then if uh, each miner only mines a few altcoins, then you still have fairly low security. So this doesn't really help us uh, all, all that much either. Right? So I basically I claim that there is this sort of fundamental scalability trilemma, which while not impossible to overcome, is very hard to overcome. And it says that a blockchain can only have two of the three following properties that I define as follows. The first property is decentralization. And here I define decentralization as the blockchain being able to run in a way that only relies on basically guys with regular laptops. Right? So no reliance on like large scale data centers. And you know, especially no needs to trust people in, in with uh, large scale data centers. Um, scalability. And scalability I also define in this kind of uh, asymptotic way that would be, should be familiar to uh, people with, uh, uh, who are computer scientists. So if, oh, and basically, the ability to process more than OFC transactions. So the ability to process some number of transactions that's super linear in the capacity of a node. And security, basically being secure against attackers with up to O of N resources. So with up to a quantity of resources that's proportional to the amount of economic activity to the, in, in the entire chain. So with regular systems, this proportion is either 33% uh, or 50% of, uh, of the nodes running the consensus. In th if it goes down from 33 to 25%, that's fine. But what we can't do is have a system where basically the more the scalability goes up, the lower the bound goes. Right? So this is, basically this says that it's, it has to be secure against at least some fraction. And this says the transaction processing has to be super linear. And this says, well, we can't have each, it's super linear in the capacity of each node that the system depends, each individual node that the system depends on. And having a, a system that actually has all three of these properties is like very much not easy. Now having two of, those, of these properties is very easy. So for example, if you want decentralization and security, then this will be satisfied by any existing blockchain. Um, if we want decentralization and scalability, a thousand altcoins. And if you want scalability and security, then super big blocks, right? But if you want all three at the same time, then life becomes much harder. Now, before we get into data availability itself, um, I'm going to take a bit of a detour into a concept that's um, been researched in Ethereum land for a while, but uh, the, uh, which is called an interactive computation. And the setup here is as follows. Suppose that we have some function, and this is a function that we want to calculate, and we want to use the blockchain to ensure that we calculate a correct answer you know, up to some crypto-economic bound. So basically, either we get the correct answer, or the people that, that, that force us to get the wrong answer lose a huge amount of money. Now, let's say this function f happens to be a function which is decomposable in this way. So we can represent f as this composition, fn of fn minus 1, off to the dot, of f2, of f3, of f2, of f1. So we have a, basically we have like a number that's being strung through all of the f's. And at each intermediate step, the number is still fairly small. Right? So one example of this kind of computation would be take a number, hash it a billion times. One in another example would be take a number and run a time lock function of, of that number a billion times. Um, one now, the kinds of functions uh, that are not represented here are any situations where kind of the intermediate states can be very large. Right? So, for this particular case. How do, we try to how do we try to compute this function on the blockchain? Now, the problem is we can't compute all of f because, well, we'll assume that like, the total computational cost of f is O of c squared, right? So we'll assume that f itself is so large that it cannot be computed on the blockchain in its entirety. So here's what we're going to do. The submitter is going to send a bunch of interactive states of the computation. So anyone can say, hey guys, I have a solution. And he's going to submit a bunch of values. S1, S2, S3, blah, 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 all going all the way down to Sn. S1 is going to be x after applying F1. 
S2 is going to be that, that result applying F2, and so on and so forth. So basically, we kind of at each layer of the onion, you would, you would provide the intermediate value. So then the submitter submits all of these values, and the submitter also submits those values along with a deposit. So the deposit basically says, here is a pile of ETH. If someone can prove that I did something wrong, you can have my ETH. Now, if you can't, uh, so the, the idea that we're going to go after here is, if, if you can't prove that the submitter is wrong, then, or if no one proves that the submitter is wrong, then that means that the submitter is probably right. And so this is the general idea around what we call interactive computation. Now, if we want to see the kind of uh, performance of this kind of system, then as I mentioned, this big F is going to be uh, kind of, OFC, is going to have complexity O of C squared, and we're going to let N be O of C, right? So each individual FI is also going to have like O of C computational cost, so which means that it can be computed within one transaction. So in Ethereum land, it fits within 6 million gas. And the number of these Fs, it will be small enough, well, it has to be small enough that it can also fit within a transaction. So that's another OFC limitation on the number. So OFC times OFC gives us the OFC squared limitation on F. So let's see what the rest of the game looks like. After a, a submission is made, with, there exists some challenge period. Could be an hour, could be a day, could be five minutes if you're really daring that way, but you'll probably want more. Within the challenge period, anyone can submit a challenge index. So anyone can submit a number. So it basically says, hey, I looked at what you're doing, and I think at position 43, you're wrong. Now, well, so someone's, the challenger would send a transaction, and this transaction would basically call you know, the function challenge of some smart contract. And as, arg as its, ar its argument, it would have uh, like i equals 43. Now, what would the function do? It would try to verify the challenge. And the specific way it would verify the challenge is when the submitter send, uh, sent all these values, the function will, would, um, would save S1, S2, and so forth. So what it would do is it would look up the value of S43 that was saved. Then it would apply F44, and it would check the result F44 applied to S43. And it would check whether or not that's equal to the S44 that was supplied. Right, so basically, the idea of the pointer is to point to a specific place in this particular list and check, you know, in this particular place in the list, was the computation actually computed correctly? If it was, then the challenger just wasted a bunch of gas. If it wasn't, then the challenger gets some portion of, of the submitter's deposit and the solution is wrong. If no successful challenges are made within some period, then the submitter gets their deposit back, and they also get a reward. Right, so this is kind of the basic idea behind interactive computation. Right? Now, as it turns out, if you want to extend this further, so if you want to extend this from O of C squared to roughly O of 2 to the C, then you can do a multi-step game. Um, and you know, you would basically, in this multi-step game, you would just have O of C rounds. Um, and if you wanted to have the state be some, have intermediate states be larger than a small number, then you can, you can do that. And the way that you would do that is you would basically have the function operate over a Merkle tree, and each individual uh, kind of record of a step would just have to include uh, some Merkle branches that basically say, you know, here is the portion of the state that I'm modifying, here is what I'm modifying it to, and here are a bunch of Merkle proofs that prove what I'm doing is correct. So. There are ways to kind of extend this and make it fairly powerful, right? So, all hail the Merkle tree. Bow, bow to the might of the Merkle tree. Why is no one bowing? Okay. You know how many gigabytes of, sing of, uh, of, of, of uh, bandwidth that guy, that guy saved you? Anyone who's ever run a Geth light node, pay more respect to the guy. <laughs> so basically, the idea at Merkle trees allow for efficiently verifiable proofs that a hunk of data is, uh, that one particular hunk of data is part of a, data of a, of a much, much larger hunk of data, which is represented by a, a, much smaller, uh, a much smaller hunk of data called a root hash.
right? So if I have a really huge hunk of data, I can make a Merkle tree out of it. Then that Merkle tree identifies that big hunk of data with a hash. And if I want to prove that any particular piece of data is actually part of the data set represented by that hash, then what I would do is I would just provide a bunch of the, like a fairly small number of hashes. And this would prove that the, ha you know, the value that was at one particular position in that piece of data actually is some particular piece of value. And if hash functions are collision resistant, then it's unforgeable, right? So um, yeah, great guy. <laughs> Ethereum uses Merkle trees both for the transaction tree and also to um, Merkle Patricia trees to uh, keep track of the uh, state and including the account list and the storage of, uh, of each account. So like Ethereum's a light client protocol and Ethereum's fast syncing. So not just the light client, anyone who's ever synced to Geth node like, or, or a parity node for that matter, you, know, you, you, you really got to thank the guy. Um, yeah, so basically what Merkle trees uh, let, you, let us do for interactive computation is once again, you know, they let you take this, these, uh, this kind of mechanism that works well when every intermediate state is a small value and they let you kind of uh, abstract the mechanism a bit and if you uh, re require uh, certain participants to provide Merkle branches in a few places, so a Merkle branch just being these like uh, sets of hashes going down from the root to a particular value, then they can do the exact same thing for com even computations where the intermediate states become arbitrarily large, so like larger than O of C in size. So that's if you just want to verify program execution on the blockchain, right? And that's the sort of thing that, for example, Truebit is doing. Now, this is also something that can be used in a blockchain, right? So it, we can make a bit of an analogy here. And the analogy that we're going to make is that processing the blockchain actually is this kind of function, right? And in fact, all of these Fs are the same. X over here is always the genesis state, right? So if, um, if anyone here bought Ether in the Ethereum token sale, then you are part of the genesis state. Um, remember that? <laughs> now, then this is like the function for process verifying the first block. And the output of the function for processing the first block is the genesis state plus, well, there weren't any transactions in the first block, so it's basically just a 5 ether uh, mining reward. Then you have F2, which is processing the second block, F3 processing the third block, going all the way up to roughly, you know, like 4.29 million for processing the last, the, the last blocks today. Right? So a blockchain is kind of a serial function that works in this way. But so you can think about interact this exact kind of interactive computation as being a mechanism that you could use to verify a blockchain. Now, obviously, you know, with um, one of the differences between uh, between a blockchain and a uh, and a regular computation is that blockchains have a lot of auxiliary data, right? So if you can imagine everyone having all of the block headers, then if he wants to process a block header, then you would need a bunch of auxiliary data. So the first piece of auxiliary data that you need is the actual transactions that went into a block. So like if someone has all the block headers, then they have, I mean, they have the headers, but they do not have the actual transactions. So if they want to actually process a block, they need the transactions. And the second thing is, in order to process each individual block, they would need a, um, the, Merkle, the um, Merkle branches of the state representing the specific accounts that were modified during that block. So if there's a block, and for simplicity, this block contains, let's say, one transaction, and this one transaction sends one ether from you know, me to, some, um, to someone else, then the auxiliary data is, first of all, the one transaction, and second, uh, with that one transaction, you should be able to show that the one transaction actually corresponds to the root of the transaction Merkle tree. And the second thing that you would need is the entries in the state root. So the, um, or, or the entries in the state tree, that correspond to basically the three accounts, 
One of them is the account I'm sending from, one of them is the account I'm sending to, and the third account is the miner of the block. And if you have these things, then you can actually verify for yourself that if you get a block plus all of these proofs, that basically whether or not the block header is valid. Whether or not the block header which says, you know, here was the previous block, here is a more a root, a more root of the transactions, here is the new state root, whether or not the new state root actually is the root hash of the new Merkle tree of the state that's, uh, that results from executing those transactions, or whether that it's just it's uh, some completely different value. So, if now what does this mean, right? Basically, you can think about trying to do an a kind of interactive computation like mechanism here. If you let's say you're a client, then you could download every block header. If you doubt any particular block, or if, let's say, someone in the network finds fault in any particular block, so let's say they think that, oh, wait, this block looks like it actually computed the state incorrectly, or this block looks like it contains an invalid transaction, then what they can do is they can give you a bundle, right? And the bundle would consist of basically a bunch of Merkle proofs. So Merkle branches for the transactions, Merkle branches for the, the portions of the state that get accessed by those transactions, and then you can use those Merkle branches and you can verify for yourself. You know, does this old Merkle root plus these transactions equal this new Merkle root? If it does, then it turns out the block is valid after all. And if it doesn't, then the, basically you've just verified a proof that the block is, that, that particular block is invalid. So you can think, uh, so you, you could see how, you know, like this kind of mechanism, and you can think about these kind of bundles as being, uh, you know, they're basically called fraud proofs, as being one kind of way by which a blockchain where that blockchain, like with a few adjustments, might have substantially more than OFC transaction capacity, could still be verified by a node that has only OFC resources because the node does not verify most blocks by default. The node just like downloads the block headers, by default accepts the block headers, and only if there's a fraud proof does the node actually try to download you know, all of this auxiliary data and verify for themselves that everything is correct. So this kind of looks like it might be feasible, right? But it turns out there's a major problem. And the major problem is um, data availability attacks. So this is the slide that um, I had at the beginning of the presentation. So here you have a Merkle tree. And you know, most of the data in the Merkle tree we can see. But there's one piece here that we can't see. And Casper the friendly ghost is afraid. So, what you know? Basically, you know, what is going on here, right? So the attack here is simple. Let's say that a malicious miner pub uh, publishes a block. This block could be valid or it could be invalid, right? But the miner uh, the, uh, publishes the block header, and the miner publishes most of the transactions in the block. But the miner leaves one transaction out. So this transaction could be a valid one, it could be an invalid one. But the miner just decides, I'm gonna keep this piece of data to myself. I'm just not gonna broadcast that part. Right? So the problem then is, well, this is still a problem. And can clients actually effectively detect this? So first of all, what can data unavailability attacks do? Now, the one, one thing that if a data unavailability attack is successful, then one thing that they could do is they could convince the network to accept an invalid block. And the reason is that there's no way to prove invalidity, right? Until this piece of data is published, there's no way to tell whether this transaction is A, valid, or B, an invalid transaction that sends you know, 10 million ether from all the major exchanges to my own wallet. So, you know, it's, it's just data, like you, you can't see what it is. And like, the ha you know, sure there's a hash, but it could be a hash of anything. So this is a problem, right? Now, let's say that we are in, you know, a, a, like ideal crypto magic world, and we have super effective zero knowledge proofs. So we have Starks, you know, we have Snarks, and they have, you know, like it's magic fairy la la land, they, you know, they have no trusted setup, they have 
we're totally happy with our crypto assumptions, they're practical to verify, everyone uses them. And so a start gets attached to every block, and so we can prove that every single that any block is valid, even if the data is not published. Right? This is all theoretically possible. But even in this kind of world where we can use zero knowledge proofs to verify or succinct zero knowledge proofs to verify validity, data availability is still, a, is still actually a huge issue. And it's a huge, uh, uh, and a successful data unavailability attack would be a huge problem for two reasons. So the first reason is that basically a successful data unavailability attack prevents the world from no, just knowing about so what the real state is of some particular account. So let's say that I have an inter, I, th this, is, this hidden transaction is myself interacting with the DAO. And, and the DAO is this you know, a huge decentralized thing on the blockchain that has, ten, uh, that let's say, st in this parallel world, still has 10 million Ether in it. If I send this transaction and I include, a, or, or if I create a block that includes this transaction, but I do not publish this transaction, then effectively, even though the world knows that everything is valid, the world now has no idea what the state of the DAO is. Right? I've basically prevented the world from just having that knowledge. And the, particularly what this also means is I've prevented the war, anyone else in the world from having the information that they need in order to make their own transactions that interact with the DAO or possibly even make, uh, make their own uh, transactions that interact with any account that I've touched. Right? So the problem is right, that if I want to make, like in general, if you want to make a transaction and you want to prove that this transaction is correct, like in any kind of cryptographic system, you don't just need the Merkle root, you also need a witness, right? And in this case, the witness is Merkle branches in some other system and the witness could be something else. But if I can prevent you from, uh, and everyone from learning the data, then basically I can just prevent them from having the data that they need to be able to construct the correct witness. So in an Ethereum scheme, like if I give you a state root and suddenly some data in the Merkle tree is missing, then no one can make, can make Merkle branches for the, to that anymore. In a UTXO scheme, well, you can't, like, basically other people have no way of knowing that there was, was not a transaction that spent any particular UTXO, and so therefore there's no way of proving that any particular UTXO is still unspent. So, these, like basically, if you prov even if you can guarantee total validity, data on successful data unavailability attacks are still fatal. And you know this is why like zero knowledge snarks and starks or any crypto magic by its uh, by itself is not going to solve the availability problem. So, here is the the kind of fundamental data availability problem. Incorrectness can be proven even to a white client, right? So we have this notion of fraud proofs. And so if there is a transaction, which let's say sends 100 ether from me to you know, some, ad some address, like let's say the DAO, but I try to create a fake a block, an invalid block, where in the state of the invalid block, the, the result is that it sends a, uh, an extra 5 million ether to myself, then this is, a, this is an example of an invalid block, and so this is a kind of uh, fraud that can be proven. Like with Merkle branches, you can even prove the fraud to a light client. Data unavail unavailability cannot be proven. And the fundamental reason behind this is this. It, fraud, uh, like simple fraud, is a uniquely attributable fault. Data unavail unavailability is not a uniquely attributable fault. Now, what, what do we mean by this? Basically, this is a special case of uh, something that I often call the speaker listener false equivalence dichotomy. And in this case, uh, in this particular case, it looks like this. So here is a kind of world, a kind of uh, real uh, case one. So this is one possible description of the state of events in some real world. We imagine that at time t1, we have evil validator one. Evil validator one, so this could be a miner, it could be a proof of stake validator, it could be anyone, publishes a block with missing data. 
At time t2, validator 2 raises an alarm. So they make some kind of message, and this is very abstract, like it could be any kind of message, that basically says, you know, hey guys, this data in the block, this particular piece of data in this block is missing. Oh no, I am scared. At time t3, validator v1 just goes ahead and publishes the remaining data. So this is world one. In case in world two, at time t1, validator v1 publishes a block with all the data. So validator 1 here is the good guy. Now here we have validator v2 who is malicious. See, validator v2 has the devil hordes now. <laughs> Raises a false alarm. Right? So v2 is now the one that's, uh, that, that's being malicious. And he basically says, hey guys, this, data is, the, the, this piece of data is missing. At time t3, v1 does nothing because v1's guy like, hey guys, I published a block with all the data uh, with all the data's already. What's going on? Why are people complaining? Now, notice one particular fact. From the point of view of any validator who or of any client that goes online after t3, world one and world two are totally indistinguishable from each other. All right, so in general, right, speaker or listener fault equivalence basically means that like there's there's say if there's one guy who is supposed to speak and one guy who is supposed to listen, then if it looks like the second guy did not hear the first, it could have happened for two reasons. One of them is that the guy who was supposed to speak did not speak speak, and the and the other reason is the guy who was supposed to listen did not listen. And like this will also exist in like in just traditional blockchain consensus because like not speaking would be you know like not creating blocks and not listening would be censoring other people's blocks. Now, in basically like those two are just fundamentally not distinguishable from each other. And in this case, you know they're even more indistinguishable. Now, this then leads to the next paradox. So let's say that we define a fisherman as being this, and this is like a, a term of art that was created by Gavin Wood. But let's just say we define a fisherman as being someone who specializes in basically raising the alarm if something goes wrong. So fishermen go around hunting for unavailable data. So kind of like challenger, challengers in our interactive computation game, kind of like, you know, like any uh, challengers in Truebit, basically someone who looks for this, this kind of fraud and points it out. In this, in world one, we're gonna uh, create. A, we're gonna ask a question. What is the expected return of being a fisherman? So, what it, we're gonna just ask a very generic question of all protocols. What is the expected return of being v two in in a case where world one well, case this uh, case is frequent? If the expected return is greater than zero then there's a mon the, the protocol has a money pump vulnerability. The reason why the pro so money pump vulnerability basically means that what you can do, it, what an attacker can do is they can just go, go around raising false alarms on random blocks that actually do have all of their data correctly punished or published. And because case one and case two are indistinguishable, they can just go around doing that. And we've already established that they can make an expected profit. So if this, so this is bad. Right? Now, let's say the return is exactly zero. Now, now, you can't money pump the protocol. You can't just extract money from the protocol by giving yourself rewards, but you still have a DOS vector because what you can do is you can basically raise an alarm on every single piece of every single block and thereby force everyone to download everything. And thereby, if the capacity of the blockchain is greater than O of C, then the amount of data everyone has to download is also greater than O of C, and so it's not scalable anymore. Case three is the expected return is less than zero. But now, this, this is okay in case two, right? In case two, this means that there's no incentive to do this kind of attack. But in case one, it also means that in the case where there are these malicious validators publishing blocks with missing data, there is no incentive to be a challenger. And so there basically then you become vulnerable to this attack where an attacker just publishes a bunch of blocks with missing data. You might have a few altruistic challengers to challenge. The attacker just outlasts the challengers, so the attacker just waits until, wait, waits until the altruistic challengers run out of money. And then, basically, once they all do and once they're all gone, the attacker starts uh, doing whatever data and availability attacks they want. So, basically, you have to choose, you know, choose between three evils, and there, are kind of, there is no good way out. Now, 
it turns out that there are a, you know there are actually a couple of ways way out a, a couple of ways out and I'll go through them very quickly. Now one of them is this random sampling approach. So basically you in the protocol you assume or you make an honest majority assumption and the honest majority assumption basically says we're going to randomly select committees and each committee is going to look at one particular piece of data and we're going to kind of delegate our trust to these committees. So we're going to make an assumption that the majority of what every committee says is honest and so if there is a piece of data and if the majority of some committee signs off on having seen that the data is available, then we treat the data as being available. So this is one solution. Um, another solution is that basically client, this is more trustless and it's actually very close to being fully trustless is um, client side random sampling. Right, so the idea basically is that instead of every client checking for availability by downloading all of the data, the client just basically samples 100 random transactions, sees if they can actually download the Merkle branches for all those transactions, and if all those transactions are there, then they accept the block as being actually available. So this is a strategy that lets you audit the availability of an arbitrarily large file in basically with like O of log, uh, o of log n space. Right. Now, this works well against attackers that try to down that try to withhold an entire block or even 50% of a block. It fails against attackers that try to withhold 0.01% of a block. Right. So, if an attacker withholds 0.01% of a block, then on average, a client like a client would needs to make about 10,000 checks in order to detect an attacker. If um, an attacker withholds one transaction then a client would have to download on average almost everything in order to actually uh, actually catch him. So the solution to this is basically erasure codes, right? So basically we take the original data and we extend the data in from let's say eight chunks into 16 chunks or 8,000 chunks into 16,000 chunks and we use fa like fancy spooky math and the prop to generate the extra 8,000 chunks and the fancy spooky math has this property that any 8,000 of these 60,000 chunks are enough to basically reconstruct the entire data set. Now, um, if you want a proof that this is possible, I'll give you a very simple proof. Let's say the original data had two chunks. We're basically, we're just going to take those two chunks and we're going to put those two chunks on a line, right? So we're going to draw a line and we're going to put the, and we're going to just put, two, put down two points and we're going to encode the data in the original two chunks into the coordinates of the points. Two points make a line. Now what we're going to do is we're going to extend the line and we're going to take two other points on the line. Now we have a line and you have four points on the line. Now as any mathematician knows, if you have any two of those points, then you can recover the line and so you can recover all four points. So that's basically how this stuff go, this math works in a kind of two of four setting. Now, if you want to go to a, go from two of from two of four to let's say three of six, then you can either go from a line to a plane, or you can go from a line to a parabola. And you know, if you want to go higher, there are base, there are like ways to do that. Fairly simple ways to do that as well. So this is something which is doable, and there are you know like there I've actually done it and. There are results, and it actually does seem to work fairly well. Um, and so, now the one uh, the one kind of drawback for this kind of approach is that you actually do need another kind of fraud proof that basically says, you know, this particular block is invalid because the erasure code is malformed. But like that's another detail, and we already have fraud proofs. And in ten years from uh, ten years from now, maybe we can replace both kinds of fraud proofs with uh, with like zero knowledge proofs like Starks. So this is basically the state of the art in terms of like dealing with data availability issues. Now, just to kind of summarize and put, up, put everything together, now you might ask, well, okay, well, we have, let's suppose that we have all of these ingredients. What does a scalable blockchain actually look like? And like, it's actually if you're not that difficult to uh, summarize, right? So basically imagine that instead of having one blockchain the way that we have uh, like, that where you have this kind of one big universe of accounts what we're going to do is we're going to have a blockchain that has let's say ofc separate universes right so uh, just to make it more con con concrete let's say 200 separate universes each one of these universes is kind of like its own account space and every block is going to have instead of having um transactions 
if the, the kind of, you're actually going to have a three level block structure, right? So the current block structure is two level. So at the top, you have a, um, so in a two level block structure, like at the top, you have a block header, and then at the bottom, you have a block. Here, we're going to have a three level block, a, a three level block structure. At the top, we have a block header, and the, the, we're going to have a Merkle root, which is going to make a Merkle tree. And that Merkle tree is only going to be a Merkle tree of collation headers. Now, what is a collation header? It basically is like a block header, except it's a block header for one of these specific universes. So you might imagine people sending transactions, and these transactions only affect, let's say, you know, universe number 84. And so they're only allowed to affect accounts in universe number 84. And then you have a, a collation header is basically just a header of a block that contains a bunch of transactions that are only inside of universe 84. And it contains like Merkle tree roots for the previous state and the post state of universe 84. And then the, you have the, these collation headers. And then the actual top level block is going to contain basically just a bunch of collation headers. So. No node is ever going to download the whole thing, except maybe people, maybe block explorers like Etherscan, right? Most nodes are only going to, like, well, there would actually be three levels of node. So you would have the very full node, which would only be like, which we could call an archive node, which would be run by maybe just a couple of block explorers. Then you would have pure white clients, which would just have the top level header. And you would have a bunch of nodes in the middle, and the nodes in the middle would have the top level blocks. So they would, they would keep track of all the collation headers, and they would keep track of all the block headers. And if there is any particular shard that there are any particular universe that they're interested in, then they would, for that particular unit, basically act as full nodes and actually keep track of all the transactions for that particular universe. To fully track any one universe, it takes OFC effort, or OFC computing efforts. To track, keep track of the top level, it takes OFC computing effort. The scalability of the whole system is OFC squared. Now you might ask, well, how can a node that only keeps track of the top level be confident about the, sec the security and correctness of every single universe? Well, the answer is they either rely on committees or they rely on a combination of erasure coding to prove availability and waiting for fraud proofs to prove correctness. And realistically, they can just rely on, uh, rely on both of these mechanisms. And you know, basically, like the, the scheme itself will only break if both of these mechanisms break at the same time. So you know, like this is roughly how kind of blockchain sharding in a way that's kind of as secure as I think is possible, uh, as I currently think is possible, would work. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, can we give another round of applause for Vitalik? Excellent speech. Good job, Vitalik. So um, we are going to have a panel discussion. So if uh, Thomas and Joseph could come up, and Steve, of course. And uh, yeah, just going to move the chairs real fast. Things. Yeah, busy, as you can tell. Yeah. No, no, that's not mine. Short name. Okay, see you. Have a good flight. Yeah, yeah, He's have gonna. A good flight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah,
so. Okay, well, okay. if somebody insists, I'll be tolerant, but I won't cool. actively. All right, thanks, Steve. Uh, all right, everyone. Uh, thank you for your attention, and hope you've enjoyed this event so far. Um, I think we've had three very great speeches. Uh, June had to t catch a flight out of the country, but uh, Thomas, um, who is quite knowledgeable about Mise as well, will be speaking in this place. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Steve Waldman. Steve is a quite prolific um, writer, developer. He's sort of a renaissance man incorporating technology and economics, uh, quoted in the New York Times and other places. So he will be moderating the panel. And yeah, here's Steve. Thanks, guys. So thank you all very much for wonderful talks. Okay, I was told I have to kiss the microphone. Mm -mm -mm. Um, so um, I hope you all feel loved. Um, thank you guys for very wonderful talks. You're high-powered speakers, and you delivered as expected. Um, I'm going to start and ask you guys to sort of discuss some, some really pretty general things. So Omise is maybe a good starting point for what is kind of a, a general problem. So um, Omise, one thing that struck me as particularly cool about the Omise talk was the fact that there is already a vast payment acceptance network attached to Omise and a, a difficult thing in the cryptocurrency token world is the fact that we can invent all these tokens and want them to be accepted for payments maybe, want them to be usable, but until we persuade old world actors to make them usable, they won't be. Um, Omise doesn't have that problem because Omise can persuade itself. Um, but one thing that struck me about um, one of June's slides, um, and I, I hate to kind of hold you responsible for them since you're not June, but, um, but I will anyway, um, is that we had a graph of acceptance and exchange and then cash in and out, which strike me as a nice stack that you're building and also struck me as very vertically integrated. Um, and this gets to a general question that I think um, any and all of the panelists might address, which is we talk a great deal about decentralization um, in this space, but it strikes me as ironic that we have a business model that is vertically integrated um, and ultimately if it succeeds wildly, which would be wonderful for you guys and well-deserved I'm sure for you guys, we would end up with something that looks a lot like Visa or MasterCard, a vertically integrated payments network. Um, are there ways that these projects can in a substantive way, besides the fact that in the infrastructure there are lots of different nodes involved, but in some substantive way be decentralized in a way that really empowers end users who aren't the vertically integrated Omise in a way that's qualitatively different than the existing payment networks that we're kind of running away from? Hello? Uh, okay, so um, I'm Thomas and uh, I'm a special advisor to uh, the Omise Go project. But uh, that said, I do follow it quite closely. And so I think I'm competent to answer the question. Um, so maybe Jun's slides and, and presentation in that aspect uh, was a little misleading because uh, the OMG network is actually a public uh, and, and fully permissionless network. So what this means is that uh, the stack that is being built on top of the network um, is uh, optional. It's uh, uh, just what Omise is doing for uh, Omise's own business purposes, but the network which uh, contains a, a decentralized exchange in the consensus layer um, and also cross-chain uh, uh, compatibility will be able to be used by any type of uh, payment service or even individual who wishes to spin up their own wallet and, and offer their own uh, services. So there is no need to use any Omise uh, or Omise Go business product uh, uh, or, or layer at all to use this network. This network is essentially as free and open as uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum today uh, when it is built. Okay, well, uh, thank you. I think uh, for others, it's, it's really a general problem in the crypto space that a lot of projects and protocols are decentralized in their infrastructure, but 
not necessarily at the application level. So if, if any of you have, uh, Thomas wants to respond a little bit more. Uh, then. Yes, I forgot to say. And so what that means is that uh, any competing payment processor or, uh, uh, you know, yeah, anybody who wants to offer the types of services that Omise is seeking to offer uh, using this network uh, can do uh, just as easily or freely uh, as well. Okay, thank you. Any other panelists want to comment on this? So it definitely is, I think, uh, something that I have noticed in other places as well. So like one example is that uh, when I was uh, visiting Russia a few weeks ago, um, I was um, in, briefly invited for um, a breakfast by a, a company that was making a uh, kind of Digix DAO style gold token. And one of the, th so, you know, they kind of briefly outlines to me their business model, which seems to be a combination of doing this kind of gold token and some more advanced scheme that involved somehow mo like monetizing uh, uh, coll uh, gold collateralized loans that would be based off of like uh, that would be run through some uh, run through a network of pawn shops. Like the details are kind of fairly complicated, and. I get real, but then when I ask them to go through the details, one of the questions I ask them is, you know, like what? Okay, so you know, what network are you going to be releasing this on? And they said, oh, well, we were thinking of Ethereum, but then you know, we're going to do our own DPoS thing because we want to have high transaction processing capacity. And at that point, I wanted to ask them, well, why are you creating this token and uh, this gold token in the first place? Like, if you want gold tokens that have high transaction throughput, then there exists, you know, like plenty of gold, like gold-backed tokens that are based by based on centralized systems already. And now, I personally, I do think that running even centralized things like that on top of a blockchain does have value. But the extent, but but the extent to which it has value is the extent to which you're running it on a blockchain that's not a blockchain that you control yourself, that's fully designed around your your own particular platform. Right. So they were basically trying to. You know, fully control, you know, do this once again vertically integrated thing where they were trying to fully control, you know, the user experience of, you know, you buy the gold token here, you trade the gold token here, you cash it out here, you you would in, you would inspect the gold over here, and what I think that they what the suggestion I ended up telling. Get, uh, maybe convincing them of is, well, guys, don't bother with this. Just like make an ERC-20, right? And it's like, okay, well, sure, the ERC-20 by itself is not going to have high transaction throughput, right? But the whole point here is that if you all create a service that provides value within the context of a decentralized network, then you should be considering yourself as being kind of one node in one layer of the marketplace. And you know, like if we have you know, like standards and, people, and if people generally respect standards compliance, then what that means is that if you create gold as an ERC-20, then you are going to be immediately compatible with, number one, every single Ethereum wallet. Number two, any, if any um, Ethereum-based uh, token scalability solution, so as soon as someone comes up with a, with a running plasma chain, you know, people will be able to use that to trade your gold. And you know, you'll be immediately compatible with any, any blockchain upgrade. You'll be immediately compatible with any privacy solution. And so it, you know, you're not going to need to go through this work of simultaneously specializing in being a gold issuer and specializing in making a fast blockchain. Right? Like the, those are two very different technical competencies and really do, should be ideally left to kind of two separate sides of the market. And they, I mean, they, this particular group did seem to accept at least initially that this was a good idea. But I mean, they're clearly, clearly not, I feel, not the only example, right? Like we have, you know, things like DigixDAO, we have things like this, and yet, as far as I can tell, there's still no kind of just simple gold back, just no nonsense ERC20, you know, gold back token on the blockchain that I can just go ahead and trade on Ether Delta. And, you know, I mean, if anyone, if there actually is a gold back to ERC20 token that I can trade on Ether Delta, anyone feel free to correct me, but so far I don't know of one. Right? And like, to some extent, I mean, this might be a failure of just people kind of not fully understand, kind of understanding kind of the right way to do things. To some extent, it could be, of course, people realizing that you can, you can have a much better chance at just getting monopoly profits out of making a fully integrated solution than you can out of, you know, the kind of being, being this kind of one node in a, in a large ecosystem. I mean, it could be a, a combination of different factors, but this, um, 
it definitely is like the sort of thing that we should that I mean I think we have been doing a fairly good job a good job at our, already in some areas so like it is the fact that there are plenty of wallets that are compatible with like all ERC20 tokens and any ERC20 token is by definition compatible with all of these wallets but you know, like at the, at the same time, there are a lot of services that could be designed in a way that's kind of more standards based and, gen and uh, uh, generic in that particular way. I mean, for like, the um, OMG case specifically, I mean, I think it's, I mean, as a company, they are, uh, it does kind of feel vertically integrated in some ways because it is a payments company that is in some ways creating a network that solves a problem, a problem that they have themselves. Though, on the other hand, they are doing, uh, I, mean, I think, doing a good job of modularizing the platform. So you have OMG as a thing that exists on one level, and Omise Go, or, or sorry, and Omise is one of the companies that'll hook into it, but there's also going to be plenty of other companies that could hook into it and that'll have equal status with Omise. And, you know, like if, if it really is a kind of fiat and crypto capable decentralized exchange, then, you know, like it'll um, hopefully just end up supporting like any like all ERC twenty tokens out the door, so it um, we'll see. I and mean, I think uh, it's I think as the number of projects increasing, like the amount of interoperability is go uh, is going to improve. Okay, so as a very quick OMC specific follow up, um, Thomas, if you can say because maybe you can't because this is sort of a, a a business plan question and maybe it's indeterminate or or confidential, um, which is fine to say so. Um, but for that interoperability story to really be powerful, the the kind of um, moat or market edge that it sounds like Omise has right now is the acceptance network, which Omise now plans to open up to ERC-20 tokens and to become an exchange and open up to ERC-20 tokens. Will that acceptance network be open to competing applications? That's really... Mm, yeah, I mean, it's something that we say can't control. This is a totally open network. Okay, so that's a it's a big deal that if I can make my own token and my own application and thousands of merchants mm -hmm. in Southeast Asia yeah, will accept it. Stripe could just come onto the network. Right, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, uh, Stripe could do their own acceptance, but right now it's hard to persuade the existing players to, and it's, ex it's exciting that you guys are, are planning to. I mean, that's an exciting thing that an existing sort of fiat regulated payments network is going to accept tokens, arbitrary little tokens as payment. Well, that's an the, exciting piece of news. I mean, it's not necessary because the, the, the exchange is something that happens in the network, right? So if um, payment uh, gateways want to participate in that exchange then they can and payment gateways may also wish to uh, themselves only accept certain ones and so then it would have to go through uh, the order book someone else provides the liquidity and then uh, the uh, payment gateway accepts only those currencies which they want okay so well. it's it's uh, it's optional and uh, uh, my point about Stripe coming on is that uh, I think, uh, based on my understanding, Omise knows full well that something like this could disrupt the uh, existing business, and, and yet uh, it just seems like a, a good way forward because uh, uh, having a head start is valuable, and uh, also because uh, it seems like this is just the, the sign of the times. You know, the tech is going to go this direction. When it's time to steam engine, it steam engines. Yeah, no, it would be a it would be a big deal to have sort of universal acceptance and by ordinary businesses rather than weird crypto projects of these things. Um, so let's uh, flip a little bit. So on on one side, there's a, the possibility that something might be um, be too easily made non-standard and uh, vertically integrated and monopolistic. Um, on the other side, with respect to plasma, so this would this would be. Um, something for Joseph and Vitalik to maybe address. There's a question of how do you decide when something is ready to standardize? So the general idea of trying to scale blockchains by using them as sort of a court of last resort by sending commitments to the blockchain, initiating some things on blockchains, um, 
and then doing scalability by having applications that work off chain or in child chains or lots and lots of variations on that theme with the capacity of agents in the off chain entities being able to challenge or cash out or something on the main chain. That's been in the air for a while. Um, right now, there's a great deal of enthusiasm in the Ethereum world around Plasma, um, and that's largely because you guys have great reputations. Um, I wonder, though, is there a danger, or when do we decide, should we think of Plasma as an experiment right now in that space, in a world full of lots of experiments in that space, or should we think of it as a, a, an emerging Ethereum standard that we should kind of plan on building around and how do we make that decision about when we should think of something as an experiment in a world that's still experimenting with lots of things to figure stuff out and when we should decide okay look we want to standardize on this so we're all interoperable let's go well everything in this space is an experiment right i mean everything we're doing right now is sort of like well this is all for tests you know right now um you know a couple years ago the mistakes were you know million dollar mistakes <laughs> We're now in the territory of billion dollar mistakes. That's still cheap, um, you know, which is why I think we really need more developers in this space because we need people experimenting with everything, see what security models work, see what mechanisms work, um, you know, at least before they become trillion dollar mistakes, you know, several years from now. Um, so, you know, is it, is it an experiment? Yeah, everything here is an experiment. We're dealing with economic systems and human incentives around those economic systems. So it's not like you can properly fully model something. You know, some people come out and say, well, you know, why don't you just model these things? And, you know, that's like saying, well, why don't you just play poker with fake money? You can sort of know what's going to happen, right? And like, no, people behave very, very different under those systems. And that's why, you know, is, is this an experiment? You know, I would say, you know, we're still at a stage where we barely feel comfortable with the concept of proof of work, right? Um, so there's that side of it, right? Is, is it an experiment? Everything's an experiment. We're all making something with the eventual goal that it can be robust. And the goal right now should be exploring the problem space so that we, so we figure out what solutions work um, in order so that we don't need to make these tests five years from now. Because if we make these tests five years from now, it's going to be far more expensive. Um, secondly, the way Plasma and, um, you know, to a lesser extent, what we've seen with Lightning, Lightning has required several changes in Bitcoin, which has all gone in, um, with the exception of, you know, perhaps some security robustness um, changes. Um, you know, these are a layer on top. They require minimal changes or no changes on the existing system. So it's sort of what is a standard on that sense, right? It's not, you know, when you say a standard, it's sort of a, you know, a formal system of how to go about things and interoperate. Um, it's certainly not consensus critical in the sense that, well, if two parties disagree on how to operate the system, that they must come to agreement. You know, you can design, you know, whether it be Lightning or Plasma um, on top of existing systems and use different protocols. And certainly that increases transaction costs between the people using different protocols. And standardization is desirable for interoperability, but is not a hard requirement. As a consequence, um, I think it's preferable to encourage you know, a certain degree of creativity and a certain degree of exploration. Um, I don't think one should start out the gate building a standard. One should start building implementations and then eventually converge upon one that, ones that make the most sense. Um, design by committee from the beginning for cutting edge technology is a recipe for disaster. Um, now, when people start using this stuff for real financial transactions, you do want this network effect, you do want interoperability, you do want compatibility so that people are able to transact between each other, but you know, we're, we're, we're barely there yet, and I have confidence that we can get to a stage where that, that will happen when it needs to happen. And I think, like, as for what, we, what practical things we would want out of, just as an example, plasma standardization, like, I could see 
One example being the ability to have a kind of generic plasma wallet where you could point it to you know, different plasma chains that might differ at least somewhat on some, on, on some properties like the consensus algorithm, but which would have enough commonality and things like Merkle trees so that you could have just one piece of code for doing things like depositing, withdrawing, and sending transactions inside of all of them. So like, I think once <clears throat> it gets more established, there definitely will be lots of opportunities for standardizing specific key pieces so that these uh, wallets would have uh, to, to deal with fewer kinds of configurations. But you know, that's still a definitely a discussion for later. And, and like definitely payments are the most clear case for standardization mm -hmm. yeah. because it's sort of you want to be able to receive payments on a chain that you've never seen before. In order to do that, you need to have you know, code which your software is willing to accept, right? You're not going to want to be willing to accept funds in code that you've never reviewed, and therefore that does inherently require some form of standardization. Okay. Um, so a motivation of that question, I guess, just to, to clarify a bit, it's, I, th I think it's a, a pretty tricky question. Um, and I guess the, the motivation is the question of, there are a lot of developers in the world and they gotta decide what to work on. Um, so to the degree that they think something is an experiment and things aren't standardized, then people will try other things too and figure that it'll all work out in the mix. To the degree that people decide that something is an emerging standard, they might prefer to work on something else and wait for the standard to emerge. Um, and so I guess given the well-deserved prominence of the two of you um, as authors, um, that's where I think it might be something worth kind of trying to clarify to the community so that people know I have some crazy idea about how I want to do sort of off-chain and um, reconciliation in the main chain or resort to the main chain. Uh, should I work on that? Or is that sort of already done and in train and there's going to be a standard? Um, no, so. that, 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 that's, that's sort of a feature, right? That's sort of good. You want people to feel like they have the ability to you know, make the changes that they want in a system. If it's an environment where it's just like, oh, there's this committee doing things. I kind of don't like dealing with committees. I want to I wanna explore and find, find interesting things. That's even greater discouragement from a developer perspective, from an architecture perspective. Um, it's, it's much more fun if you can say, hey, I'm going to experiment on something, get public recognition for what you're doing and the contribution you're making, and whether it be in mechanism design or in like developing code. You know, right now, like, if there is a standard implementation, that's sort of the worst case scenario because you're just like, well, I'm sort of contributing to this other thing where if you disagree with the way it's being done, you sort of have to play politics. Um, under a model where, you know, it's, it's early on, things are being developed, things are being formalized uh, conceptually and implementation-wise, then you sort of feel like you have the ability to make a difference and you actually do have the ability to make a difference. And I think that's very exciting from any developer's perspective. And I think that's why the space is growing really, really quickly. Because everybody has the ability to make their mark today. There's a nine-figure company in Asia Pacific that has confidence in uh, you guys and this uh, paper. That's enthusiastic about Plasma, that has confidence in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I think there's a lot. There are people with very good track records who are working on it, and so that's, I think, both a blessing and a curse. Um, it's a blessing because there are people who are gonna do a wonderful job, and it's a little bit of a curse because there's a kind of effect that, um, you know, there used to be a thing, I'm an old guy, older than most of you. Um, and back in the 90s, there was a thing, never work on anything Microsoft is working on, right? Um, so there's a, there's a hazard at a social level to that kind of effect. Um, I think probably we should move on. So um, you guys gave pretty technical talks, so I'm gonna feel free to ask some pretty technical questions, um, if that's okay. Um, so never. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God! Um, so, and um, both uh, both of your talks, Joseph and Vitalik, were reliant on Merkleized fraud proofs, mm -hmm. and the notion that something sort of effectively off the main chain could run lots and lots of steps and gain scalability that way, and only occasionally check in with a hash with a commitment to the main chain. Um, and Vitalik explained in admirable depth how a fraud proof works. Um, one thing that occurred to me is 
a concern over the overhead of the fraud proofs themselves. So Merkelized means we don't have to send the whole state. We can only send some state. But as Vitalik pointed out, we need to know what the transactions are. And if we have all of these kind of plasma subchains and they might be running, I, I don't know how many, but I, I think to get the scalability, you want tens or hundreds or maybe thousands of blocks between checkpoints. Um, so that means if there is a dispute, a challenge to the main chain uh -huh. is, is what someone has to submit to the, does the main chain have to do a lot of computation, effectively rerun state transitions for a whole lot of transactions in order to prove the fraud or prove not? Um, yeah, so I mean, in the case of Plasma specifically, it's, I mean, if we just assume a simple UTXO system for the Plasma chain, then there is basically two kinds of fraud. The first kind of fraud is a, tra is a block containing a transaction that spends a UTXO that, that was never created. And the second kind of fraud is a transaction that spends a UTXO that was already spent. Right, so the first kind of, so for any, like if someone makes a withdrawal, then the format of the withdrawal is they basically like give a Merkle proof of a transaction that basically sends their, that sends their coins, um, that on the plasma chain sends the coins into a black hole. Right, so that by itself is like basically you have a Merkle branch, the size of the Merkle branch is a log n, and, and log n, or more specifically log n times 32 bytes. So. If we imagine these blocks on the plasma chain coming, let's say, once every like 15 seconds, and each of them having like, two, let's say, 500 transactions, then you know that'll be like nine times 32, so about 300 more bytes. Now, if so, before reference, like a, a simple transaction is 100 bytes, is about 120 bytes. Now, if for a fraud proof, the fraud proof in both cases is just another single Merkle branch, so that's also going to be something like 300 bytes. So it's Actually, like in the case of plasma, it's actually not, or in the case of a, of a UTXO system, it's um, actually not that long. Although you could say that that's partially because we're like these, uh, like the, those fraud proofs are, are fairly short, partially because they're pointing to block headers and there's a large number of block headers and there is an implied other Merkle branch in the contract storage of the contract that actually stores all these block headers. Well, like even still, like altogether, if you assume like a billion UTXOs in total, then it's like 32 times 30, which is basically a kilobyte. So it's, there is overhead, but it's not too much overhead. Yeah, it, and it's not that big of a deal even with tens of kilobytes because, um, you know, these are expected to be extremely rare and extremely costly to the person that generates it. And so there is sufficient fees in order to pay for it. And it's only contained within the very, very compact aspect where the fraud happens. Because it's Merkleized, you're not doing all the steps. You're doing only the step that, that where the fraud happens. OK, so, so the, the, the offer of the fraud proof is going to be very selective. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, uh, the responsibility is going to be on the part of the person. A person's not going to say, oh, between block 1 million and 1 million 100,000, when there was a checkpoint, something bad happened the challenger is going to know where something bad happened and offer a very compact proof. Yeah, in the final form, you're not like including the entire block. You're only including the points in the block where the fraud happened and then the Merkleized commitments that prove that that was in the block. OK. Um, so, so that gets to another interesting question about a lot of these schemes, which is how do you guys envision without uh, sort of a, another form of seeping centralization occurring um, the monitoring? of these kinds of schemes uh -huh. going on. So a thing that I fear with this general architecture, um, state channels and everything that hangs off of it, is that if I were an ordinary user who didn't know anything about Merkleized fraud proofs or something, and in order for these schemes to work, I have to basically be monitoring um, for a bad activity that I can challenge at a certain point. Um, am I just going to end up offloading that to some sort of centralized cloud service to monitor these things on my behalf? And should I be worried about that? Well, the centralized service is sort of a backstop. Um, you are making time trade-offs. So the time in which you, know, um, you can have the window to prove fraud is likely going to be associated with the, win the delay window in which you can withdraw money in the event of uh, chain failure. 
Um, if you're willing to make that time long enough, so let's say you're willing to make it several weeks or even a month or, or, or even longer, that's the, that's the point in time in which you need to periodically check. Um, so it's something which if you leave your computer on you know, and turn it on maybe once a month, you know, once every several weeks, it's perfectly fine as a result. Um, additionally, you know, you, your phone is probably going to be online. The system is going to be designed where you know, eventually you can you know, use it on your phone. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's, your phone is very frequently connected to the internet, and you can, you can prove fraud that way. Um, so it's, it's, I don't necessarily really see it as a problem. Um, I don't know. Do you have anything? Yeah, and I yeah, generally agree. And it's, um, like, it's, it's, it definitely becomes a problem if you want to try to make these, uh, ch these uh, challenge windows uh, smaller. But like, if, if you keep them wide enough, then, and, and you can have enough infrastructure to kind of make sure that pe to uh, kind of make sure that people actually do appear in a, like a, uh, online enough then uh, they, uh, it should work okay it's also your software doing this so yeah. you don't really need to do any work yourself yeah it depends I, if, I if think the like the best solution for like, because notification is like a one event security model i think the best approach is to just combine different approaches so download an app on your phone then you know like register with you know some centralized service like etherscan which will email you if they if they see anything then if you don't trust them register with another centralized service and if any like do ask out of out of thing on your computer if any one of the four works then you're fine okay and so you guys envision if it's working on the phone you basically envision the overhead of monitoring to be on the order of a light client overhead not yeah. something yeah. heavier than that yeah. yeah okay so that's important um with respect to the map reduce um, scheme and example, one thing that occurred to me um, as potentially an issue, so you gave the example, which was a really nice example of, of, a, of a generating an order book, which is nice for map reduce because it's commutative and associative. You don't really care in what order you combine the orders together. Um, but an issue is, is that when you get to the top chain of your order book, you might have a lot of orders. Um, and one general issue with Ethereum programming um, in general is that it's, it, it's hard to do things that involve eventually having to iterate over a large set. Um, so the map produce seems to me that it can generate the large set very quickly. Um, but are we going to need to combine the scalability and parallelism with something that relaxes the restriction of the block limit at the higher level chains? No, I mean, um, the, the order book can potentially be like hundreds of megabytes, and it can still be enforced on the, on the root chain, because um, it's, if there's fraud, it's only the, the fraud proofs that need, to be, that need to be proven. So the idea is that you, know, you have the order book is merkleized itself. So if there's you know an order book that like mismatches, you just like okay, here's a zigzag, prove yeah. it that way. So this one isn't really a security question, but more like a liveness question. So uh -huh. you have a hundred of megabyte order book on, uh -huh. at the top of the chain, and then you've got to iterate through it to match to find the price. To well, you're not you're not iterating through you know. I, I don't I don't see what the problem is. So you have uh, a thousand. Bids and a thousand asks, mm -hmm. um, and a computer should be able to compute that very, very quickly. A computer can. A computer yeah. is really good at it. Yeah. Um, I guess maybe maybe that's sort of an off-chain thing or not. In the existing Ethereum implementa implementation, my sense is that it's a big. Oh yeah, yeah. You can op let's say for each individual use case, mm -hmm. you can optimize and hard code it natively in the code essentially, um, if it becomes an issue. Essentially, you're saying the speed of solidity is like... No, no, slow. not the speed of solidity. It's not the speed. It's, it's that iterating over sets of arbitrary size is dangerous because you might get to a point where you can't execute your transaction because there's a block limit. I mean, uh, block limit the where? The system should be designed in such a way that the size of any fraud proof is bounded. Or, at, the, or at, at worst, it's bounded by a log, in which case it'll still be below, below the block size pretty much in any case. Okay, so that's a, a fraud proof, mm. but even the the act of crossing the orders, putting aside the question of fraud, 
It's just a different kind like of scalability. Most of the stuff, but the actual computation happens off ch happens off chain, right? So it happens in okay. like specialized systems where they don't need like they they don't need to obey gas limits. They can have their own rules and like this could could even be like specialized nodes doing this it could be you know it could be some parallel distributed algorithm okay so along with the scalability kind of down the chains you guys are envisioning as part of plasma the notion that a well, smart contract within its own node might sort of arbitrarily outsource computation outside well, no, of no, the, no, the no, general no. idea of plasma right is that you would have a bunch of separate nodes that are maintaining the chain and that are performing computations associated with the chain, mm -hmm. and then the and then on the actual chain or associated and then on the main chain you would just have mechanisms that enforce fraud proofs. And the point of these mechanisms is to basically keep the nodes maintaining and, and, and executing computations on the plasma chain honest, right? So the one analogy is like if what if like in my presentation I uh, gave the example where. The, the kind of true bit like interactive computation example where you just have a really long computation that you have to run through. So this could be just anyone outside the system doing the computation. And as long as you can break it up into chunks and kind of insert basically like require people to come up with some kind of like Merkle tree of the, of the computation trace that goes where, um, where each, each individual chunk is small enough to be verified inside the chain, and then you're fine. Okay, yeah, no, your, serializ your serialized computation example yeah. would solve this problem yeah. of, uh, you, do it, you, you said that quite explicitly in the talk that OC is less than the block limit, so you, yeah. if you can chunk it in series less than the block yeah. limit, you solve that problem. So mm -hmm. it seems like in order to take sort of large reduced sets in plasma, you also need that scalability yeah. solution in order to work through the large reduced mm -hmm. sets. Um, mm -hmm. So those two bits of your talks go together quite nicely. Um, more sort of plasma arcana. So the subchains periodically commit their state hash to the chain above. Um, who does that? And how does it deal if the subchains are using something like Nakamoto consensus with proof of stake or something like that? There might be transient forks and there might be games being played about which head of the subchain gets committed to the main chain. How does that work so or get decided? Th theoretically, this like is like Plasma is compatible with almost any consensus algorithm being run on the subchain. So like I have a design for like a, a minimum viable Plasma prototype that's so far written up in a document, and there I just use the dictator algorithm. So you know, here's the key of the guy who runs the thing. And so like surprisingly, even that actually does g technically give you all of the security properties of you know like in, even if the dictator is absolutely evil, everyone's still guaranteed to get their money back. So like the worst thing the dictator can do is just waste two weeks of every one of people's time. The um, now it could also be proof of stake. It could also be like in general like having fin like finality bearing consensus algorithms tends to work better. And the other thing that work like. Yeah, so basically algorithms where like once you have once something gets finalized something conflicting can't get finalized without like a bunch of a whole bunch of, of uh, obvious fraud happening and the other thing that helps is that you do have the access to the main blockchain as this kind of timer and so you could also say things like have as part of the consensus rules things like the first block that passes these conditions that get in get, get in wins yeah, the, the fun part about this is, yeah, you, you can abstract away a lot of the complexities of proof of stake because you have an underlying chain, right? You can, you can like, things like timing, time stamping, and things like that are really, really hard problems in proof of stake, and there's a lot of excellent research being done with the Ethereum Foundation with this. Um, but with Plasma, you sort of cheat and just punt the problem down. So because of that, you can just do really, really simple systems. There's an example in the paper, but like honestly, there's probably even simpler systems and even easier things to do, um, or more robust things as well. So, um, so maybe the, the easy example is, the easy way to say it is that the, the subchain should be lots less complicated and lots more easily finalized mm -hmm. than the main chain, so these problems can kind of go away because they inherit sufficient security from the mm -hmm. main chain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, well, I think maybe a thing to do is to ask our three wonderful and exalted panelists um, whether they have any concluding remarks, any things that they'd like to say. 
No? <laughs> um, okay. I have only one concluding remark, which is that I am pleased to announce that as of two hours ago, the first Metropolis hard fork by Xantium has been successfully activated on the Robson testnet. <laughs> Death and parity are still in sync as of about 750 blocks. Oh. Well, that's a, a lovely reminder that, um, especially Vitalik, but all of our exalted panelists are doing remarkable and amazing work, research in real time, and have a remarkable track record of turning these bizarre ideas that show up on these slides into things that actually do function, which is a hard trick. Um, so we are all very excited, I think, to yeah. see how things yeah. function soon with Metropolis and later as yeah. Plasma and Serenity and Omise and all the other wonderful projects that you guys are working on go. And so I think I will just thank you guys once again for your amazing talks and thank you for participating in the panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have another round of applause to everyone. And uh, I think the, these talks are amazing. And thanks, thanks, thanks guys.